everyone to this event. Um, this is uh, a seminar uh, for three seminar speakers uh, on the topic of evolution in biological engineering and synthetic biology, and then a debate about the idea of perhaps what we should be looking forward to uh, over the next 10 to 15 years if we are going to start thinking about incorporating evolution into biological engineering or working out ways to engineer evolution so it's something that we can control in in real time in in cells in uh, in systems that we care about the idea uh, for this theme came about from uh, people within imperial college uh, where we have a center of synthetic biology uh, coming together to discuss what the uh, uk research uh, funders have called big ideas which are new topics that are almost uh, as large as inventing new new entire fields of research. So if you're familiar with synthetic biology, which kind of emerged in the year 2000, um, that started from uh, conversations in the, in the mid 90s and led to the emergence of a new field, which has become quite a large field now. And really the UK RI big ideas are, are thinking of those kind of um, changes, the, the trying to uh, think and coalesce people around ideas that could themselves become entire new fields like synthetic biology was and systems biology was as well. And so one we discussed was evolution and the ability to manipulate and engineer evolution or the ability to um, engineer taking into account evolution. So as part of that, this uh, big idea, we've decided to uh, organize an event to discuss this issue. Uh, I'm going to uh, change my background now to uh, just put up the information uh, about our schedule. So we've got three seminars from people who work in the um, uh, boundaries between uh, evolution and uh, biological engineering first. 25 minute talks uh, from three really fantastic speakers with Phil Holliger being the first speaker who's, who's here and almost ready to go. Um, we will not have uh, immediate questions and answers about their topics. We've instead trying to have as much time as possible for a panel debate um, at the end of the three seminars, uh, where we'll be joined by Victor De Lorenzo, Eric Usmanski, and Mark Isolan, uh, who also have uh, a lot of interest in this particular question. And so we hope that the majority of time to interact with the audience uh, and to discuss questions can be for this general pan panel debate. I just want to point out first here that um, we, on Zoom webinars, we have the Q&A function. Uh, we've got a, a few people helping out um, from my research group on looking at those questions. You can vote for the questions that you, you can upvote them with the little thumb icon to, to push the best question or the most popular questions to top, the top of the list. And that can help us choose what to ask the panel in the debate session uh, later on. And you can also write questions specifically to the speakers if they've, if they've had something in their talks uh, our three seminar speakers that you would like clarification on or something and then write in your Q&A that it's specifically for them in their talk and uh, although there's no dedicated time for them to answer uh, at the end of their uh, talks about the about questions that might arise they can type answers back to you if, if they've got the time um, so they'll be able to reply to you on that. So anyway without further ado I'm going to switch now to Phil Phil, are you ready? And, yeah. Uh, okay, so I will Good. spotlight you. You're, you're the big screen now, and uh, you can share your screen to begin your presentation whenever you want. Uh, I'm getting the message from host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, that's right. So I'll change those uh, settings. Uh, give it another go. Okay. There we go. Okay. And now where is it? It's here. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Tom, kind of, and the organisers for for inviting me and giving me a opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, the work of my group in this uh, engineering biology with evolution space. I think what we are most interested really is is to you know to bring sort of both new chemistries and maybe new mechanisms um, 
uh, to both biological systems in vitro and, and ultimately hopefully we can integrate these also into uh, living um, uh, in, in vivo systems. Um, so in particular we are interested in the flow of information in biological systems. This was you know, summarized in the 1970s by the famous central dogma by Francis Crick. This needs no introduction. The view at the time was that the flow is unidirectional from information flows from DNA into RNA and then into proteins. As I said, unidirectional. This turns out to be a oversimplification because at least the information can flow from RNA back into DNA by the actions of reverse transcriptases and telomerase. And really, I think the fact that information can flow backwards and forwards between those two, um, I think naturally leads to the question, you know, could other, you know, could other kind of polymers uh, talk to the central dogma in the same way that DNA and RNA talk to each other? Could information flow in and out of the central dogma onto other chemistries? Or to put it slightly more eloquently, can we conceive of simple chemical alternatives to DNA and RNA that would be capable of genetic function, that is heredity and also evolution? And to do that, really, you need a chemical framework, and we call these XNAs for xenonucleic acids. They don't occur in nature. And then what you need is an XNA writer that uh, reads DNA and writes XNA, so transfers information from DNA into XNAs, and then you'd like to know what you've made. Uh, to decode the XNAs, we need a decoder, so that would be an XNA reverse transcriptase, which reads XNAs and then writes the information back into DNA. And if you can... Uh, achieve both of this, you sort of close a replication cycle for XNAs via a DNA intermediate, a little bit like a retrovirus that replicates its RNA genome via a DNA intermediate. And replication enables evolution. And, you know, out of this space, you can then begin to uh, explore the evolutionary, the sequence space of all possible XNA sequences. And within this, I'll just briefly touch on that, we can find XNA ligands, aptamers, XNA catalysts, and also elaborate simple nanostructures. And really our goal was always to be able to do this, not just for one case, but to build a, a generic uh, technology to, 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 to be able to apply this to a wide range of chemistries. Um, and so we spend a lot of time uh, you know, on technology development to really be able to engineer both polymerases and reverse transcriptases to work with these non-cognate chemistries. This is just a brief summary. So the, the, the key method for polymerase engineering is what we call CST for compartmentalized self-tagging. I just quickly explain the principles. So <clears throat> we basically, um, so CST is based on a positive feedback loop whereby a polymerase uh, modifies its own encoding gene, or in this case, its own encoding genetic element. This is a plasmid. Um, and if you look at uh, the scenario, so we compart to, to, to enforce genotype-phenotype link uh, linkage, we compartmentalize uh, polymerases and their genes encapsulated into cells into the aqueous compartments of a water and oil emulsion. Um, and then when we release the, uh, both the polymerase, these are the sort of the red spheres and it's plasmid from its cell, we also encapsulate within the same compartment a primer with a five prime biotin capture tag and the XNA triphosphates. Now, uh, the polymerase we're looking for, an XNA polymerase red, can actually extend this primer, uh, priming on, on the plasmid encoding the gene for the red polymerase. And what this does is it stabilizes the interaction of this primer with the plasmid and hence with the polymerase gene. So we can capture that gene later on while the blue polymerase can't do anything with the triphosphates. So that gene will be lost. Um, reverse transcriptase engineering is a lot harder and this took us a while because what you have to do in this case, you have to somehow import the non-cognate chemical substrate from the outside. And here's the way we found to link those two things. Again, we start with a bacterial library uh, of polymerases or reverse transcriptases. And then we release within the aqueous compartments of a water and oil emulsion, we release both the polymerase and the encoding plasmid into 
uh, into a compartment, and this compartment also contains a microbead, which has been preloaded with a XNA template in green here, and a primer on the plasmid, as well as a capture tag to capture the plasmid. So what you end up with is like, for example, the red polymerase, which is the sort of XNA reverse transcriptase that we need. Um, it can extend the primer uh, XNA template complex. It can convert the XNA into cDNA, and then you can read out uh, that cDNA synthesis signal using a fluorescent probe and, and, for example, isolate the beads, which then also have captured the encoding gene by flow cytometry. And this has just come out uh, in Nature Chemistry. Uh, earlier on, we had succeeded on making um, you know, much more primitive rever XNA reverse transcriptases. Um, and this sort of got us you know, some, uh, some, somewhere half the line, but they were never very sufficient uh, in, in efficiency. That's why we eventually developed this method. Uh, but, but this allowed us already to start with you know, discovery of XNA aptamers, and this is all published in XNA enzymes and also building, synthesizing the building blocks for simple uh, uh, XNA, uh, um, you know, nano, nano structures, nano objects. For example, this is a uh, 660 kilodalton octahedron assembled from fluoroarabino nucleic acids. And this actually required, this is a sort of a quasi origami structure. This required a synthesis of a 1.5 kilobase XNA strand. So that was quite, tough. But really what I want to talk about to you today is another um, aspect of all these different XNAs that we examined up to that point. Um, uh, they were, you know, charged. But, but really the, the, the highly charged nature of the natural nucleic acid um, to some degrees limits the functions that you can encode. I mean, it clearly is a central aspect of genetic function, as has been argued by, by, by many people, because um, the polyelectrolyte nature really decouples the information content of nucleic acids from the physical chemical properties, which is really ideal for an information storage medium. But at the same time, the highly charged nature, because it dominates the properties, sort of limits the type of ligands and catalysts you can elaborate, and also makes it very difficult to get these into cells. So chemists have worked very hard to come up with uncharged backbones. And, and really the only three that work, I mean, this is a catalog of abysmal failures. And the only three which sort of seem to work to some degree is peptide nucleic acids, which have found uh, a sort of a niche in diagnostics. Morpholinos, of which there is now a FDA approved antisense drug to modify splicing induction muscular dystrophy, and also phosphonate nucleic acids, uh, FNAs, um, which have, uh, were initially used as sort of first generation antisense oligonucleotides, but have come back uh, with renewed interest in the, in the current crop of, of, of antisense uh, drugs that are in clinical development. And these really are the closest mimics to, to the natural structure. So this is where we decided to start um, with this work. Um, because they're, as you can see, they're essentially isosteric and nearly isoelectronic. The only, but if you want crucial differences is that the charged non-binding uh, oxygen in the phosphodiester linkage is replaced by an uncharged alkyl, methyl, ethyl, etc. Uh, um, substitution in phosphonates. And the question is, you know, can, can, you know, clearly you can make these and they can hydrogen bond to DNA and RNA, but that's not sufficient for genetic function. Can we encode, replicate, and evolve a genetic function in an uncharged backbone? Uh, and step one is you need to synthesize, um, you need to synthesize the, the, the substrates and already you see kind of where the trouble starts, you know, replacing the oxygen now creates a stereocenter at the phosphorus. So your synthesis doesn't yield a single substrate, but it yields um, a racemate of which only two, sorry, of which only one is, a, uh, is an actual substrate um, um, 
for the polymerase. And you know, you can you, you can purify these on HPLC, but it's 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 a very laborious pro process. And the nature, the location of the peak actually doesn't tell you which of the diastereoisomers you have uh, isolated and which is the substrate. So we need to understand what the stereochemistry is at the phosphorus. We need to understand which substrate is, the, is, 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 is incorporated by the polymerase. Um, and to you know, figure this out, we turned to a great collaboration with a, a molecular dynamics group at the IRB in Barcelona, Modesto Orozco's group, and they modeled for us the SP and the RP uh, substrates into the polymerase active site. You can see the structure here. This is the SP version docked. This is the RP version docked. And then we used one that was grossly distorted as well to see if, uh, you know, if the system would, would, would sort of find, find its way back to a, a energy minimum. And luckily, the, the results are very, very clear when you look at both the stability of the complex, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the bond length, kind of, you know, the positioning of the alpha phosphorus for attack and the number of hydrogen bonds to the template, only the SP uh, stereoisomer can be a substrate for the polymerase. So now that we know that, we can also build a model of, uh, of the helix, kind of like of the, the phosphonate helix, and you can see how much the charge uh, is reduced in this case. We, we worked with the ethyl uh, aversion in, in, in these cases because they were easier to synthesize chemically than the methyl. Um, so we have two problems now. If you look at this picture, we need to engineer the polymerase both for a tremendous loss of negative charge at the, uh, at, at the polymerase nucleic acid interface, and obviously also for unsatisfied charges on the polymerase side, as well as to accommodate the increased steric bulk uh, of, the, uh, of the ethyl group. And to cut a long story short, kind of, uh, we identified using both CST and sort of semi-rational engineering, we identified four key mutations which significantly improved phosphonate synthesis. As you can see, in many cases, these are mutations which mutate a highly charged, a positively charged residue to a small uh, hydrophobic uh, side chain but that still didn't give us good synthesis. And clearly there was another problem. And this structures, these are the structures of the phosphonate triphosphates as docked into the polymerase active site. And it, it shows the problem. Uh, as you go into the active configuration of the triphosphate, which has this sort of almost like a scorpion tail uh, conformation on the, uh, on the triphosphate, you can see in ethyl phosphonates, the, uh, the alkyl group in the SP configuration now comes too close to the five prime position of the pyrimidines, while in the purines, the distance is fine. So we needed to go back and resynthesize the methyl version of the pyrimidine triphosphates and also replacing T uh, with uracil. And when you do that, now you can see you get very nice uh, synthesis of phosphonates and also note the reduced electrophoretic mobility compared to DNA, because clearly now, apart from the DNA primer, this is an uncharged polymer and therefore migrates much slower than the equivalent length DNA through a gel. Now we can synthesize these and we, we also showed that we can reverse transcri transcribe this with you know, pretty low efficiency. So for evolution, we wanted to, you know, not be depending on a relatively weak uh, reverse transcriptase. We didn't have the uh, CBL method at the time. So we turned to this trick that was first described by uh, Jack Shostak, which allows you to really elaborate these polymers, you know, without the need uh, for a reverse transcriptase. And this is where you start with a random sequence, which is designed to fold back on itself. And you then synthesize in this case, the, the phosphonate nucleic acids, and then you simply displace the red strand with by filling in uh, the DNA into a double strand, and so you end up with this sort of display package where, um, um, you know, the, 
there's a double-stranded piece of DNA which encodes the sequence of the XNA which is displayed on its surface and you, you, fold, you fold that single-stranded strand, you bind it to a solid, uh, solid phase uh, target, you wash away the non-binders, you elute the binders and you can uh, go back to that. And using that we were able to uh, isolate a uh, ligand for streptavidin and this just shows the um, this just shows the sort of binding uh, affinity to streptavidin compared to a target uh, sorry a control antigen IgG. You can see if you if you do this with pure sp uh, phosphonate uh, triphosphates, you don't really get much better binding. So clearly the polymerase is quite capable of picking the right uh, um, substrate out of the pool out of the racinate. So when you scramble the phosphonate sequence, there's no binding. And also, interestingly, if you switch from the mixed ethyl-methyl phosphonate backbone, which I described, which gave us good synthesis, to an all-methyl, you also lose, lose all the binding. And not shown here, if you go to all-ethyl, also no binding. So clearly, the distribution of methyl and ethyl groups on the backbone is key. And you can see the binding specific, no binding to neutravidin. And you get, you know, not stunning, but you know, decent affinity uh, 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 in in in, uh, in biocore. Now, interestingly, also this this seems to bind in the in the biotin binding pocket because it can abrogate uh, binding to streptavidin by adding biotin. But really, the suspicion was always like, what if there was still some binding contribution of this double-stranded? Uh, DNA tail. How do you prove that? So we made different constructs in which case they only had a short uh, DNA tail remi remi remaining and um, somewhat disturbingly kind of the binding uh, activity of this was reduced but we made another version where we could uh, where we could um, delete uh, sorry de degrade the whole DNA except a single deoxynucleotide at the um, at the five prime end, and actually, this, in, if anything, showed better binding than the than the full construct. So clearly, all the binding activities encoded, as we hoped it would be, in the phosphonate uh, uh, portion. And also, interestingly, this kind of all phosphonate ligand now becomes, you know, quite dependent on surfactants, on detergents to stay in aqueous solutions, but with a single charge retains approximately micromolar solubility. But you, re you remove that last charge, um, uh, the solubility goes. So just to uh, summarize this, this first uh, part of my talk, so we've elaborated the first uh, aptamer, the first ligand from a completely uncharged methyl ethyl phosphonate backbone. It's specific of streptavidin. It requires both the methyl and the ethyl groups and the specific sequence. And it looks like the DNA tail must be double-stranded because if it is single-stranded, even a short tail, it does interfere uh, with binding. And only one to two negative charges are really needed to support micromolar solubility. So in general, I mean, I think what this part, uh, you know, this work sort of has shown that evolution really is an emergent property of probably a wide range of information carrying polymers. So if we can you know, implement replication, we can implement revolution. And there is a clear opportunity to maybe import some of these orthogonal chemistries back into biology to set up uh, sort of genetic enclaves, orthogonal genetic systems within the cell. And then finally, on, um, in contrast to previous assumption, clearly a polyelectrolyte backbone is not absolutely required for either uh, genetic function or evolution. And there's obviously biotechnology applications to this, you know, this sort of expands the um, nucleic acid chemistry toolbox of, of polymers that can be synthesized and evolved. And, you know, we can make aptamers, enzymes, and nanotechnology objects, as I briefly alluded to. And it's just a family picture of all the XNAs, um, you know, we've been able to work with so far. But now, for the second part of the talk, I'd like to return to the, um, um, uh, to the uh, uh, central dogma. And 
sort of a dichotomy that was immediately recognized uh, in the central dogma is the fact that you need nucleic acids, DNA and RNA to make proteins, but then you need proteins again to make nucleic acids. So how, you know, how does such a system get started? I mean, it's a classic sort of chicken and egg problem. How do you boot up life? And at the time, over 40 years ago now, Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel and Carl Boos kind of made a, at the time was pretty far-fetched uh, suggestion, but you know their idea was really that there might have been a primordial biology preceding our own, which didn't did away with DNA and proteins and just was mainly based on RNA. And this has become known as the RNA world hypothesis. Um, and you know, in, in in various forms, kind of, I think um, compelling evidence compelling circumstantial evidence has accumulated over the years, maybe the smoking gun really being the structure of the vibosome, um, that uh, there the, the might be a lot to, 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 that, uh, to that idea. And it's worth exploring, uh, certainly. And, and really the cornerstone of that idea was always the idea that uh, in an RNA world, RNA would sort of replicate itself. That this was powered by, if you want, an RNA replicase mainly based uh, on RNA that would be capable of self-replication and evolution and hence ever more efficient self-replication. Um, and to explore this, we started with this amazing ribosome shown here on the left from uh, uh, Dave Bartel's lab. I mean, it still sometimes blows my mind that something so comparatively simple can carry out such a complex function because this is really a RNA polymerase. So this is a RNA which can read out another RNA strand and synthesize its complement with really uh, quite uh, good uh, efficiency and fidelity. You can see this on the left. It'll take about 24 hours to synthesize, to copy 40 nu 14 nucleotides. Now the polymerase itself is about 200 nucleotides long, so clearly there is some distance to go, but we wondered if we could bridge that gap. And really the minimal goal was initially to, to, to engineer this ribosome to quite the ability to synthesize RNAs as big as itself. And we used another one of, of our uh, evolutionary methods. We, li we like to let nature do all the hard work for us. So um, this is another selection strategy, CBT, compartmentalized bead tagging. And, and, and it's really very, very simple where, you know, we start with beads a single copy of the ribosome gene and about 10,000 copies of this black squiggle here, uh, which is an RNA hairpin. And we compartmentalize into evolution, into, sorry, into uh, um, water in all the emulsion droplets. We carry out a, a coupled transcription ligation reaction and this decorates the beads with the ribosome. And when you break the emulsion, you have a collection of clonal beads. You know, the red beads have only red ribosomes, the gray beads only gray ribosomes. We can charge these with a primer template and, um, and you know, let the ribosome do its job. And then the rest of the workflow is really only to convert this primer extension signal into a fluorescent signal that allows us to isolate the best ribosomes to just uh, accelerate. So this then gets us to a ribosome that can actually synthesize RNAs that are now longer than itself, but it still can't do itself. And why is that? And this is what we hit. We call this the RNA <clears throat> self-replication paradox because it turns out these polymerase ribosomes can't read through RNA structures because RNA needs to fold into a 3D structure to encode function such as polymerase ribosome activity, but then the folded RNAs cannot be replicated by the polymerase ribosome. So what can we do? And the solution we came up with is to change the type of substrates. We looked at the number of substrates and trinucleotide triphosphates, which I will call triplets, really look the best. And I'll show you why. So this is a series of templates with an increasing sort of fold back hairpin. Um, and you can see the, the, the mononucleotide polymerase cannot copy any of the hairpin templates, while the triplet polymerase can. And what's even more interesting, when you look at the copying activity as a function of triplet concentration, you can see on a structured template, you get this sigmoidal curve, which really implies 
a cooperative change as a function of triplet concentration. And our interpretation of this is really, is that the triplets um, actually help unfold the secondary structures. And what we really found is that these type of, this, this is the triplet polymerase ribosome, it can now copy anything. Any structured sequence, including broccoli, which is sort of very stable, quasi, um, uh, 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 quasi cheap quadruplex hairpin. And what's even more interesting with triplets, because the triplets pre bind on the template, you can now have all kinds of synthesis modes that do not occur in nature. For example, you can now synthesize RNA in both directions, both 5 prime to 3 prime, 3 prime to 5 prime. And I show you this here. This is the 5 prime to 3 prime primer. You can synthesize it. You put the primer at the other end and you triphosphorylate its 3 prime end. Sorry about that. Um, and you can also synthesize, and the two, the, the two synthesis reactions can go at the same time. And you also don't need any primers anymore because the triplets themselves can bind uh, uh, stably to the template and act as primers. I'm, I think I'm starting to run out of time, so I, I, um, I will not talk you through it, but just trust me, primer, you can synthesize completely without primers. And obviously you can synthesize RNA now in three different triplet registers. And the beauty of living in the age of deep sequencing is you can now actually analyze exactly how uh, the ribosome does this. So this is the, all the potential synthesis pathways of this short RNA sequence shown at the top. And if you had a 5-3, five, 5-3 five to three prime synthesis, you would see this clockwise arch. Uh, a reverse direction synthesis would give you an anti-clockwise arch. And what do we observe? This is what we see. So you can see there is a sort of you know, quite nice clockwise arch, but there's a whole lot of other products. And actually what turns out is that the reaction does not proceed in triplet steps from one end, but it then jumps to a second initiation point here, which has its own arc that, um, that then completes synthesis. So in this case, you have two independent initiation points. Um, this is another sequence, and you can see there's another more complicated picture. Here we have an anti-clockwise arch, but in fact we have at least two anti-clockwise arches. And if you go into detail and you analyze it all, you can see there's at least four independent initiations um, how, where the, how the triplet polymerase kind of copies this uh, a piece of RNA. So to, sum, to summarize, triplet-based RNA replication now enables general RNA synthesis by a ribosome on essentially any template. We, can, we haven't really found anything that we can't copy. Um, it can, and indeed, it can now synthesize itself, both its plus and its minus strand of the catalytic subunit. It still has to do it in segments. It's not very processive. But once it's, once it's synthesized the individual segments, it can then also assemble those plus segments back into a new active subunit, which can reinitiate the new cycle of replication. As I said, it, it unlocks these non-canonical modes of replication, which don't occur in nature, like bidirectional, primer-free, and multi-register. And uh, I haven't shown you this, uh, it makes minor groove contacts just like uh, the ribosome does in its decoding units with the triplets. And I also haven't shown you this. There is some very interesting properties of the triplet substrate pool where you have 64 individual triplets, which include both each triplet and its anti-triplet. And these triplets form triplet-anti-triplet -triplet interaction networks which, as it turns out, do enhance the replication fidelity. And just a final sort of postscriptum, it's sort of interesting to compare two triplet decoding RNA machines, one our polymerase and one, of course, the ribosome. They obviously both proceed in the triplet register, the ribosome only in one direction, uh, the triplet polymerase in two. They are both actually a processive heterodimer. I haven't shown you this. The triplet polymerase actually requires a um, inactive uh, RNA subunit uh, for full activity. They both monitor the minor groove uh, and fidelity 
at just two positions of the triplet while allowing a wobble pair at, at the third position, same in the triplet polymerase as the ribosome, and also there are adjacent triplet site interactions. So it's, it, it's quite tempting to speculate kind of that there is actually some co convergent evolution in those two completely different systems. And with this, I'd like to end and thank the wonderful people who did all the work. Uh, Vitor Pinero, Alex Taylor, um, they both now started their own labs. Vitor in Leuven, Alex here in Cambridge, and Sebastian went back to the States uh, to work for Sangamo. And Yella kind of likes working on a, a COVID vaccine at CureVac in Germany. Uh, Jamie will start his own lab now in UCL, and Aditya is now with David Liu at Harvard. And um, I'd like to thank also Pete Herdevine specifically and Modesto Orozco for some great collaborations. These uh, people for funding us and you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. It was great. Um, wonderful. So uh, very interesting to see. I love your phrase, let nature do all the hard work for us. I think <laughs> we'd love to do that in a lot of synthetic biology engineering. Um, really exciting talk. So people uh, who are watching, feel free to ask questions to Phil in the, uh, in the Q&A. He, he may have time to be able to type some answers back to you if you've got specific questions. I know I've got lots of questions, but I'll, I'll save them for the discussion debate part at the end. Um, we're going to move straight on to our next speaker, Tammy Lieberman from MIT in Boston, uh, who I believe is ready and is going to give us an interesting talk, I'm sure, about um, microbiome. Uh, she's sharing the screen right now. I'll unmute you, Tammy, if that's okay. Oh, you, you've got yourself muted, I think. And I can spotlight you on the video as well. Perfect. Okay, hi. So um, that should work. Everyone can see my PowerPoint screen and just that. Yeah, it looks perfect. So feel free to start whenever you're ready. Uh, so, so it's great to be here. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and and my, uh, my lab study is the microbiome. And hold on one second, the uh, pointer is not misbehaving now. Is it a clicker? All right, I'm just gonna have to click. Oh, there it is. Um, so my lab study is the microbiome, um, the community in and on us. But unlike a lot of labs uh, in the microbiome field that focus on species composition and how that species composition cha uh, changes over time or varies between different groups of people, uh, what our group really focuses on is how individual species within these microbiomes might change and evolve within us. And you might think that bacterial evolution within a microbiome might be something that happens over very long time scales that aren't relevant uh, to an individual. But actually there's just really an enormous potential for evolution and adaptation within our bodies every single day. If we just do a really very basic, simple calculation based on the number of bacteria in and on each of us, uh, the average size of their genomes and uh, the average error rate of, of bacterial replication, uh, we wind up uh, with an estimate of about 10 billion mutations created every time our microbiome replicates, which is probably be about probably about once per day. Right. So even if the vast vast majority of these mutations are deleterious or neutral, this still represents an enormous potential for adaptation in our microbiomes every day. And so uh, what our lab is doing is trying to understand this uh, evolution, but also to leverage this, these mutations to accelerate, our micro, acceler accelerate the development of microbiome-based therapies. Um, and the reason we want to do this is that we're, we're excited about the potential of microbiome-based therapies to improve health and wellness. Uh, you may be fa uh, familiar with the famous efficacy of fecal, tra uh, fecal transplants in curing recurrent Clostridium difficile infections. Um, but people have also been treated for other diseases already uh, with microbiome-based therapies, including uh, using an asymptomatic E. coli to outcompete urinary tract infections. And I'm, I'm really hopeful um, that synthetic biology, um, as well as uh, natural biology, uh, will provide us a, a slew of rational probiotics for our gut, our skin, and anywhere our microbes live in our body. Right? I'd like to have bacteria that live on me long-term that supply vital nutrients to my uh, gut or secrete sunscreen uh, when I walk out into the sun, right? And I, as a lot of you in the audience might be synthetic biologists, 
Um, maybe you actually go into the lab and make an E. coli that sort of secretes sunscreen in response to, to UV light pretty quickly, right? But actually figuring out, so, so it's not necessarily the, just the synthetic biology that's the challenge, but actually the ecology as well, right? How do you actually get these microbes to stick long-term, right? To understand what I'm saying, um, we can take the example of, the best example I've seen so far of getting microbes to really stick, or what, uh, sometimes we call it engraft in a microbiome. And this was a bacteria taken from humans, given to humans, and after remo removal of probiotic administration, you can't detect this bacteria anymore in half the subjects. Right? And so we don't know, um, you know why this bacteria, but not others, has any chance of sticking, and you know, what the difference between these different groups is. And the reason is that we're still really in the early days of understanding the biology and the ecology of the microbiome. We don't know what the niche range is for an individual bacterial strain, right? So this, can the same bacteria that live on me also live on you? Can um, a bacteria that lives on my chin also live on my cheek? I don't know. We don't know what the selective forces are that determine these different niche ranges, right? So we, we might have some intuition of what these things might be, Maybe the immune system plays a role, other microbes, but exactly what, which forces matter to which bugs, we don't know. And lastly, we don't know the role of within-person evolution, right? Maybe the bacteria within me are, all, are already pre-adapted to the unique set of selective forces within me, and so any bacteria trying to compete with that, that pre-adapted strain isn't going to stand a chance. Uh, the cool thing is, in the perspective that we take, is that by studying uh, within-person evolution, we're gonna learn about this important force, but also we can get answers to these other questions as well. And um, this is something that has been done a lot in the field of infectious diseases, um, where people use evolutionary reconstruction um, to understand transmission across people uh, and also um, across a single body. And also um, by looking at the individual mutations that are happening and particularly particularly mutations that happen over and over again in different people, um, we can identify the, the genes that are most important to change in, in an individual and, the path, and therefore the pathways and selective pressures that might be most threatening uh, to bacterial survival uh, in a complex microbiome. Um, and so we still know very little about evolution within complex microbiomes in, in humans, and it's kind of perplexing maybe. You might ask yourself, why, why hasn't this been studied more? And, and there's a conceptual reason and a technical reason. And the conceptual reason first is that people think that in order to study evolution, you've got to do a very long time series, right? You've got to get some bacteria from someone one day, get the same bacteria from them some time later, um, and compare them. And no one wants to do you know, a PhD that maybe requires such long longitudinal sampling. Um, but what we've learned over time is actually that, that while uh, time series are always the best, uh, we can get actually a, a lot of information by studying the coexisting diversity within a person at a single time point. And we can do this because even as if bacteria are adapting and adaptive mutations are rising in frequency in a population, it turns out that in a lot of inhuman systems, different adaptive mutations tend to coexist. And, and in this this coexistence pres preserves diversity and therefore preserves an evolutionary record that we can go in and understand which mutations have recently happened in this person. And there's also a technical reason. And the technical reason is that in the microbiome field, um, it's really been dominated, uh, studies of humans have really been dominated by culture independent methods. So this is taking um, maybe just looking at a species level barcode, which doesn't give us the resolution to identify mutations. Or, um, or using metagenomics, which is, you know, just chopping up all of the DNA in a sample across different organisms, sequencing little small fragments and trying to put, to put them back together. And the problem is that it's really hard to stitch these things back together to the resolution that you really need uh, for evolutionary reconstruction. Because an individual might be colonized uh, by two different closely related strains. And so what you really want to do is identify de novo mutations that are happening from a diversification of a strain within an individual and be able to distinguish those de novo mutations uh, from pre-existing variants that occurred 
way before the person was calling us. Um, in addition, when we identify these donor novel mutations, we want to know if they're really in the same cell. And, and doing these things is hard. You can write all the fancy algorithms you want, and you're not going to be able uh, to put these pieces back together to the resolution uh, that we need. And you'll just have to trust me on that. And so what we do is something uh, a kind of akin to single cell sequencing, but, uh, but older school, uh, in that we first grow bacteria on petri dishes. And because each colony uh, is formed by a different independent cell uh, from that initial sample, when we go in and we sequence these colonies, uh, we, we're basically sequencing the organisms of different, uh, the genomes of different organisms in that initial sample. And very few mutations uh, occur during this uh, grow out phase. I'm happy to talk more about that later, but, but for now, just trust me that we're able to uh, remove those uh, computationally. Um, and then after we sequence these genomes, uh, we, we do evolutionary reconstruction and focus on these de novo mutations that happen on the tips. Uh, this, this approach is more economical than you think. It costs about 20 bucks per isolate, including sample prep and sequencing. And, you know, so therefore it's not too much money uh, to look at many isolates from a single sample. Of course, the downside is you've got to know which species you want to focus on at a single time. So we use this approach in my postdoc to understand how Bacteroides fragilis adapts within individual people. And we found a really strong evidence that even in with these, these really healthy uh, stool donors whose poop is medicine, um, we find evidence of adaptive evolution uh, where the same gene is getting mutated multiple times. Um, it's corroborated by other signals of, of adaptive evolution. And, and we, we were able to identify um, outer membrane uh, genes and importers of complex polysaccharides is important to change within these individuals. Um, we were also able to get really observed by chance, by combination, by the fact that we also had um, really time-resolved uh, samples for some of these subjects. We were able to really observe these really interesting dynamics where ad adaptive mutations outcompete their ancestors on time scales of you know, a couple months or up to a year. Um, but then they, but they don't um, outcompete their very closely related strains from which they had a common ancestor only um, what we infer to be less than 10 years ago within that person, right? And so what this looks to us like a functional diversification of one strain into two different coexisting strains uh, for 10 years. So this might mean that they're doing different things in the microbiome, but perhaps these two things are just coexisting because they're actually just separated in space. And so my lab now uh, works more in the skin microbiome uh, and, and so uh, where, where we can really begin to ask questions of spatial resolution. And I realized that I went through a little slower uh, through the introduction than I intended. Um, so I was probably gonna just tell you one story today, not two. Um, and this, this story is about uh, a sebaceous uh, microbiome. And, and this, we, we really don't just focus on the skin microbiome, we focus on the sebaceous skin microbiome. So the sebaceous skin microbiome is the, the skin on, on your face, your back, your chest. And, we like it because it's easy to sample at many spatial scales. We can think about uh, the areas I just mentioned or one pore to the next pore. It's low diversity. There aren't that many species um, in, in, in the sebaceous microbiome. So we can imagine characterizing all of them and how they interact in terms of evolution and ecology. And it's stable over time. So it's a true microbiome. Each person has specific strains on them. As I mentioned, it's, it's pretty low diversity. It's mostly colonized by this one bacteria called Cutie Bacterium acnes. Um, while it's called acnes, we consider it a commensal. It, it doesn't seem to be uh, super important for the pathogenic pathogenesis of acne, although it's still unresolved. Um, and so, but despite the fact um, that there's low species level diversity, we've known for a while that there's um, actually high strain level diversity. So it's a, uh, it is still very interesting, and it raises the question of why these different strains coexist on each individual. And so this story um, is led by Aaron Linton Conwell, a postdoc in my lab, and was started while I was a postdoc um, in Eric Alm's lab. And we was really focused on um, understanding how bacteria spread on the face and from pore to pore. And so the samples um, that we have taken uh, were from uh, 17 different subjects uh, using just a toothpick to scrape from eight different locations on the face and the back. But then from, um, five other subjects, sorry, six other subjects, including intensive sampling of one of them, uh, we use this thing called the comodone extractor to pull out the contents of individual pores. 
And so for each of these uh, samples, we then culture for QD bacterium acnes and sequence um, several colonies or up to 20 colonies for a, Q, a few of these uh, sites. When we look at the, uh, the evolutionary tree of everything we get, um, we quickly see that people are colonized multiple times by different strains. So this is one subject here where we can see that they're colonized by four different strains separated by many mutations, right? The scale bar here is quite large. And, um, so, and so what, we, what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk now, um, so this tells us people are colonized multiple times. And what I wanna focus on now is, is what, we, what we can look, what we can learn by focusing on the de novo mutations uh, within one of these clades. And so before I go on, I want to mention that unlike in the story that I just mentioned, we don't really see signature for adaptive evolution. Most of this change appears to be neutral. We don't see genes being mutated more times than we expect, and the genes that are mutated the most also have a signature of purifying selection to stay the same. So we're going to treat all the mutations um, that we're going to see as neutral. And we're going to ask what we can, how we can use them to understand spreading and spatial structure. And so now this is uh, one lineage um, that I've shown you before from one of these subjects. And instead of coloring by subject, I've, I've colored these isolates by pore. And what we see is this remarkable segregation by pore, where isolates from a single pore share mutations in common uh, that you don't find in any other pore. So this tells us that our, our pores are distinct ecological units uh, with limited spreading. Um, and we think that these mutations are really coming from bottlenecks early on um, during this colonization. To understand how these pores are connected, uh, we used a pore strip to collect additional samples from a couple subjects and pulled out individual um, colonies, cultured individual colonies from these different pores. And we find no correlation between genetic distance and pairwise and, and, and physical distance, suggesting that once you escape a pore, you can actually travel pretty far distance and that these bacteria perhaps are not really swimming uh, on, on the face and that they're really being may, maybe transiently carried by something else. And this kind of makes sense. Um, these bacteria really are um, anaerobic bacteria. They like to live uh, deeper in the pore where we, we think it's anaerobic. Um, and so they may not really be growing and spreading on the surface of the skin. And so this tells us that your face is, is sort of an uh, archipelago of islands as it pertains to C. acnes, uh, which is pretty cool. And to, to better understand what's going on in these pores, we can look at the intrapore diversity. Um, but when we look at the intrapore diversity, we have to reconcile that the two of these pores in the subject look really different, right? They have, these two on the top have more genetic diversity within the pore, and they also have more mutations since the most recent common ancestor of this strain. And so we, we reasoned that these um, pores might be colonized by a hypermutator strain, something with that accelerated mutation rate. And when we look, we find um, that in fact, uh, these pores do have a, a very different spectrum of mutations than the other pores, suggesting an elevated mutation rate. And so when we look at the other pores, we see on average, that there's actually very little diversity in the pore. On average, they have less than one mutation uh, per, per pore since the most recent common ancestor in that pore. And we don't know the molecular clock for C. acnes, but um, the molecular clock for every bacteria that's been studied and described so far in, in humans, you know, ranges between about one mutation per genome year, per genome per year, and 10 mutations uh, per genome per year. And so this, this means that these, these populations have not been in these pores for that long and are probably being cleared and recolonized um, over time. We can also look at the strain DMRCA and understand that this, this uh, strain has probably been on this person uh, for some, some time, some number of years. Um, I think the scale bar here got a little screwed up. Um, sorry about that. And this is something we see that's uh, kind of generalizable across uh, strains on people. Um, we're, we're trying to put these things together. And what we think is going on, these, these things together, meaning this, um, this bottlenecking within individual pores and this lack of purifying selection, so the signal of purifying selection, this lack of adaptation that we see. Everything looks neutral. And what we think is going on 
is that these bacteria really prefer to grow in the bottom of the pore, where the food is being secre secreted by the sebaceous follicles, um, where there's more anaerobic conditions, and there's some flow upwards of sebum uh, out of the pore. And so really what matters most of these bacteria and determines their growth rate is not their genotype to, in many ways, but actually uh, the, where they are uh, within the pore. And so we've been, we've been doing some modeling um, that we, we hope to uh, finish up and publish this story soon, um, uh, where we think that what's really going on is, is, is that this um, spatial structure is le really limiting the adaptive potential of these bacteria and of enabling the coexistence of diverse strains on individual people. I, I think I actually do, I, I do have five more minutes. So um, I will uh, uh, go ahead and, and give you the, the highlights of, of the next story. Um, but first, I'll summarize this story. Um, we find that people are colonized multiple independent times from the environment. Some of these strains survive on these people for very long periods of time and diversify. The, the, as they're colonizing, they seem to be colonizing in distinct islands that are spatially separated. And we think uh, that this, this really, the structure of the pore and the three-dimensional structure of the pore really uh, limits the adaptive potential of these bacteria. Uh, going forward, we haven't started this yet, but one thing we're excited about, about the fact that pores are, um, are clonal, is that if we start doing colonization experiments on humans, we can think about pores maybe as independent replicate experiments for testing colonization ability. Um, and then um, I'll give you the highlight of this last story from Jacob Baker, um, where we, we begin to under, we've been trying to understand when we get colonized uh, with cutie bacterium acnes. Um, and it presents an interesting case because people have really think that, I think in the microbiome field, there's a lot of focus on early life, where early life might be the most essential time for acquiring our microbes. But there's this dramatic shift that happens in the, in the sebaceous skin um, during adolescence, uh, where the abundance of these bacteria goes up many logs. And it's possible that, that this abundance, increase in abundance, is due to outgrowth of pre-existing strains, or due to new colonizations coming in from the environment, or perhaps some, some a combination. And we've been sampling kids at a K through eight school um, and their families, uh, using the same sort of colony-based approach and, and evolution calling. And um, we, we, we build these nice transmission networks that understand how these bacteria have spread in the past among family members and between different members of the school. And, and really the take home message um, here is that what we find is that, um, or is that we can really distinguish between these two models um, in which um, by, by looking at the percent of strains that are shared with parent, right? We have these longitudinal time points, but even just with this, um, cross-sectional time point, uh, cross-sectional sampling, um, we can just say, do younger kids share um, more strains with their parents than older kids? And, and what we find is that, in fact, younger kids do share more, more of their strains, and adolescents have strains that look like they didn't come from their parents. And suggesting that really adolescence is, is, this new, is this new opportunity for colonizations from the environment. Um, so we, you know, um, and I think uh, one, one cool thing that I kind of uh, zipped over through time is that when we do find new colonizations, um, often multiple genotypes are transmitted, and this may be enabled by the pore structure. Uh, before I end, I want to mention um, that while C. acne seems to be evolving neutrally, this isn't, doesn't seem to be the case uh, for every bacteria. We see lots of rap rapid adaptation when we look at Staph aureus, um, a pathogen. Um, that colonizes the skin of people with eczema or atopic dermatitis. Um, and and um, with that, I'd, I'd like to thank um, the many collaborators on these projects. Uh, Ireland Conwell, again, uh, was really the leader uh, on this uh, Siacnes project. And, and there were many others, including um, you know, our collaborators at Sarah School. Uh, I also want to plug uh, that our, our lab is young. We've been at MIT for three years. And uh, we're actively, for two and a half really, and, and we're, we're uh, actively recruiting uh, new lab members, including those uh, who are more interested in genetic engineering and experimental work, and those who are more interested in um, computation and developing new tools. Okay. Is that it, Tammy? Yes, that's it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, your talk was fantastic. So you were recommended, uh, I've never met you before or seen you talk, uh, but David Rigler said you give a good talk and he, was, uh, he wasn't he was lying. That was an understatement. It was a really nice talk Thank and you. fascinating stuff. Just a, a, a personal question for me. Were you part of the MIT Poop Club? I heard about this club of people who would have meetings about the microbiome called the Poop Club. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I think it was in the early days of, if, in Eric Alm's lab, right before they, I bet you that's what they called it, before they started Open Biome. Um, yeah, should, okay, uh, that might be it, yeah. And it was fascinating to, to hear that, I mean, we, we get told often that our skin is a Petri dish, but from what you were saying, it, it's actually more like that than we think with co individual colonies um, resembling what you might get on an agar played out for an experiment. Yeah, and it is a petri dish, but it's not an open petri dish, right? And I think that that's part of the, the interesting mystery, um, right? Is that we see that, you know, the, we see a lack of adaptation and we do see uh, multiple strains coexisting on the face, um, but we don't see infinite number of strains, right? There's some, some discrete number of strains that we see on each person. Yeah. And so I think, um, I think it's a very interesting thing why, why this petri dish doesn't get just taken over all the time from the environment. We're still trying to figure that out. Okay. All right. Well, um, let me just maybe I finished too early. <laughs> you can know. stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. So um, some people have already gone to the Q and A and written some questions for you. Um, if you if you want to be listening to Chang's talk, feel free to um, ignore some of those questions. Um, Phil uh, was answering his questions, beavering away. He did a, he did a great job, and I feel a bit <laughs> a bit um. A bit guilty that he was busy doing that and couldn't hear you and not able to follow your talk. So don't don't feel the pressure that you have to answer all of those questions. Okay, so I will now put us on to uh, our last speaker from the seminars, which is Chang. Yeah, please come along. And it's early morning in uh, in California. So Chang. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Tom? Yeah. I hope okay, all's well right. there and that you're not too near any forest fire or anything. Yeah, we're um we're safe so far. Good. Good to see. Yes. All right. Well, whenever you're ready, we're all right. Really looking forward well, to your thank talk. you very much for having me. Um <clears throat> and you know, I was really uh stimulated by the previous two talks. Um I wanna talk about mainly a system that we've developed in my lab called orthogonal DNA replication, where we basically build cells that have an additional replication system that is independent of the host replication system. And one of the themes that Tom mentioned for this uh, symposium is how to control evolution, right? And the main goal with orthogonal replication is that we can dial in parameters of evolution, especially mutation, that otherwise could not be adjusted in a cell. Uh, and so to, to get you to that point, I wanna start with a um, kind of a thought provoking question, which is uh, how fast can we mutate a genome? And so I'll go back to Phil's talk and start with a replicase at the origin of life. Uh, so this would be an organism, let's say, that has a very small genome, right? So let's assume it has a 200 base pair genome. And of course, some of those base pairs, say 50%, are going to be essential to the activity of that replicase. And so we can ask, given some mutation rate, here I chose 10 to the minus 3 errors per base, what is the chance that an offspring is viable? And to do this calculation under these rather simple assumptions, all we do is we say, well, there's a 999 out of 1,000 chance that a particular base is copied correctly. And if there are 100 such essential bases, then in order for the organism to survive, we have to take this to the 100th power. And this gives us a chance of survival. So this is reasonably high. And that means the lineage can propagate. But of course, if we now talk about an organism, a modern organism that has a much larger genome, then you will find that at this mutation rate, 
um, you will not get survival because now instead of taking uh, 999 out of 1,000 to the hundredth power, we have to take it to the millionth power. And so, of course, what modern organisms do, because of their large genome and their complexity, is they reduce their mutation rate. They must reduce their mutation rate. And so, if we take a mutation rate that's several orders of magnitude lower than 10 to the minus 3, then we have a reasonable chance of survival once again. <clears throat> And I wanted to give this example to emphasize the point that modern genomes simply can't withstand high mutation rates because they've gotten too large and complex. And this has been borne out in much detail and additional nuance in theory, uh, experiment, and empirical observation. Um, one corollary of this that I want to emphasize is that really what is going on over the history of life and growing complexity is that the focus of evolution is expanding over size scales. And so let me walk you through this corollary. Uh, the general rule is that mutation rates have to stay below about 1 over L, where L is genome size. And you can see this in the simple uh, thought experiment that we started with, where here I'm just plotting the chance of survival um, or, you know, the, the chance of not breaking one of the essential positions in a genome at different mutation rates. And what you see is that if, of course, you have a small genome, then you get low chances of survival at around uh, 10 to the minus 2, about 1 over this genome size. If you have a large genome, um, or not one, right, yeah, 10, 10 to the minus 2. And if you have a large genome, your mutation rate of 10 to the minus 6 is where you transition into this low chance of survival regime, okay? And so because of this rule, this kind of threshold on mutation, um, you can imagine that as complexity increases and genomes grow in size by getting more genes, your mutation rate per gene must necessarily decrease. So modern organisms are in this position <clears throat> where they are using mutations to innovate more at the systems level across multiple genes rather than focusing their evolution on any one given gene. And so this is all uh, well and good, except that if you are interested in innovating at the gene level, then we are already in this territory of life where that is not going to occur quickly in nature. And uh, one of the main goals of innovating at the gene level, or the main reasons of innovating at the gene level, is to do protein evolution, right? If we're talking about individual protein, then of course it's encoded by an individual gene, and we need much higher mutation rates to explore the mutational space of a protein than we do to explore the mutational space of a genome relative to its size. And so basically, uh, in order to access these mutation rates, we can't do them when we have this lock on genome mutation rates in cells. Um, another thing that you uh, heard from Tammy's talk is that, of course, if you want to use mutations as a molecular clock, then a low mutation rate means that your molecular clock is ticking slowly. And so if you want to use mutations as a way of recording what has occurred on faster timescales than typical evolutionary timescales, such as development, uh, you also want higher mutation rates. And so one of the main themes of our lab is to develop specialized genetic systems capable of targeted mutagenesis to get to these regions. And basically the key word here is targeted. Uh, of course, we can't break this threshold on the organism's genome mutation rate, but we can circumvent it if we're capable of dictating exactly where our increased rate of mutations can go um, and basically target them to specific genes of interest or specific loci of interest 
that we use to track uh, development. And so we've developed a couple of systems with these goals in mind in my lab. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of this talk is orthogonal DNA replication. And so a brief uh, uh, outline for the rest of the talk is I want to give you kind of a history of orthorep, which is an idea that I started my lab on um, seven years ago. And then um, I'll show you two recent applications of orthorep. And then finally, uh, I'll give you some perspectives on the value of orthorep in the context of directed evolution as a field. Okay, so here's a very brief history of orthorep. Uh, we didn't build a replication system from scratch, but rather we stole one and repurposed it um, from nature. So basically, uh, you know, we were on the hunt for interesting replication systems that we thought would already be independent that we could then further engineer. And we found a very unique, uh, we found in the literature, descriptions of a very unique plasmid system that was found in certain strains of Chloramycus lactis. And without getting into too much detail, the key aspects of this replication system are that it is, consists of uh, linear plasmids that utilize a protein-primed replication mechanism, and the linear plasmids encode their own DNA polymerase. So it was speculated, and we've subsequently uh, definitively shown that these DNA polymerases are necessary and sufficient for replicating the plasmids. Okay. Um, and the reason we were attracted to the system beyond some of the obvious that, you know, it's kind of a minimal replication system or probably a minimal replication system that is autonomous is that because of the unusual replication mechanism of protein primed replication and because it's spatially separated from genomic replication, these plasmas are actually found in the cytoplasm of cells rather than in the nucleus. Uh, we thought that this would already have the properties of orthogonality that we can exploit. And so um, early on in my lab's history, we uh, basically figured out how to hijack, do genetics on the system and refactor the elements of this replication system, resulting in kind of orthogonal replication version one, where we encoded the DNA polymerase responsible for replicating of this replication of this P1 plasmid in the nucleus, and then the protein product of the DNA polymerase uh, would actually do the replication, okay? And uh, since then, um, we've mainly been working on getting this DNA polymerase to be very highly error prone beyond the error thresholds that govern the genome and now we have a system where the mutation rate of our orthogonal plasmid is around 10 to the minus five substitutions per base. And we've gotten even uh, higher subsequently in unpublished work. Um, and now we can target mutagenesis to genes of interest on our orthogonal plasmid at this highly elevated rate compared to the genome. And we've also shown that this uh, system is general across many strains of yeast, or really all that we've tested. Um, uh, we have some understanding of the basis of orthogonality. We have kind of genetic parts and expression parts to control the level of expression for genes of interest. We have genetic parts to engineer the system and put your genes of interest on it in a very streamlined fashion. And we can even automate evolution experiments using the system now. Um, but the key uh, uh, summary of how orthorep does is shown in this slide, kind of the technical summary. Uh, basically, we have a series of DNA polymerases that we've engineered that can sustain mutation rates or uh, have P1, this orthogonal plasma, replicated at mutation rates um, across several orders of magnitude, including up to 10 to the minus 5 range. And if you look at this uh, chart, so these bars, of course, are the mutation rates of the P1 plasmid. Um, this here is the mutation rate of the genome in the presence of these 
hypermutating P1s, and you'll see that they stay at the genomic standard genomic mutation rate of yeast around 10 to the minus 10. Um, and another point on this graph is that we are in territories that you can't actually tolerate on the genome. So these kind of shaded territories are regions of mutation rates where if you try to induce on the genome, and we have uh, done so, you see that the cells become very uh, extinct or, or very sick, or they go extinct in essentially one generation, meaning that we are now sustaining mutation rates that would otherwise be uh, um, impossible on the genome. Okay, so of course the value of this system in terms of applications is that we can now continuously evolve genes of interest at mutation rates that are ex exceptionally high, and the system uh, is very durable. There's no off-target genomic mutagenesis, so we can run these experiments for many generations. And so we've applied OrthoRep um, across a number of applications. The main kind of focus of our lab now is, of course, to use it to evolve interesting and useful biomolecules, uh, typical directed evolution experiments, but perhaps hypercharged, um, supercharged uh, into new, new regimes. Um, and we're also using this system in other experiments to kind of study rules governing ad adaptation, you know, the value of population structure, how selection uh, schedules influence adaptation. Uh, we're trying to use this to map adaptive pathways uh, on complex fitness landscapes. And then we're also using it to predict evolution in nature. Okay. So I'll hone in on two recent applications of OrthoRep to, to demonstrate what it might be useful for. Um, and uh, I'll encourage you to look at some of our other papers for other applications. But one recent application, we uh, 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 used OrthoRep uh, to achieve was in the territory of enzyme evolution. And this is in collaboration with Francis Arnold's group at Caltech. Um, the goal of this particular project was to evolve an enzyme called TRYP-B so that it can synthesize tryptophan analogs. And TRYP-B is part of this uh, um, heterodimer where its partner is called TRYP-A. And TRYP-A synthesizes an indole that then TRYP-B couples with serine to produce tryptophan. Uh, and of course, this is important for the biosynthesis or, or used for the biosynthesis of the essential amino acid tryptophan in cells containing tryptophan. -E. Um, what we want to do, though, is we want to make it so that this is an uh, enzyme that is functional without its partner, such that we can deliver indole and have that reaction occur independently of generating indole on the fly. And the reason we want that activity is because we want tryptophan analogs to be fed to cells and uh, we can get the production of these valuable chiral intermediates for chemical synthesis on this tryptophan backbone. Okay, so that's the goal. And we have a number of ways of going towards this goal, including direct selection using biosensors for specific tryptophan analogs. But the successful strategy I want to show today is an approach where we basically just evolved trip B for its native activity in many replicates. And the idea here is one that is uh, um, based on natural evolution. Right? In nature, if you look at an enzyme, you'll find often many orthologs of it across different species. And uh, even though those orthologs were all selected on its primary activity, because they've speciated uh, over you know, millions or billions of years even, um, they've diverged quite a bit. And so even though they all have the same native activity, as they diverge, they just happen to find different promiscuous activities, right? Their secondary activities are not selected on, and so they can diversify. 
And so we wanted to essentially replicate this process in a controlled uh, manner with OrthoRep, where we would run many independent replication, uh, or sorry, many independent evolution experiments, each selected just for the native activity of trip B, but the diversification could then be mined to see what the secondary uh, substrate profile would be for these enzymes. Okay, and so here is an example of what we, we find. Um, the way we do this is we just encode trip B on orthogonal replication, and we select for the activity of trip B to produce tryptophan as we add indoles. And in replicate experiments, you see that the consensus uh, sequence after these adaptations um, is quite varied, right? Depending on the replicate, and we have some different starting points that we use, we get many different outcomes, okay? And you'll also perhaps appreciate that these outcomes are rather complex. These are many mutations, which is typically not seen in a directed evolution experiment, but since we're continuously evolving these new variants, they're capable of finding uh, or traversing long mutational pathways that result in the uh, overall diversity of our solutions. If you then mine this diversity, or let me uh, take a step back, um, this is just to show you that these variants are actually doing what we want. So uh, if you look at the orthorep evolved variants, they indeed are supporting growth of the cell only when we add indole. If we drop out indole, the cells don't grow. And this band here is basically the wild type growth rates of cells. So they are supporting growth uh, as well as the native uh, tryptophan biosynthesis pathways would otherwise in yeast, okay? So these would be effective enzymes. And if you then look at these enzymes and you mine them, uh, and you take what you mine and characterize them against other substrates, you see that there's quite a diversity in their success and their ability to use indole analogs and couple those to tryptophan. So now these are clones from these consensus sequence. Uh, I'll just tell you that these 60 diverse variants represent about 200 unique non-synonymous coding mutations. Uh, and you'll see that various um, members of this set can catalyze the coupling of different indoles to serine to produce the corresponding tryptophan analog, okay? And some highlights from this experiment include some members of this set that have broad activity against many indole analogs uh, uh, shown here. There are some uh, members that are very selective for one indole over the other, shown here. And then there are also some uh, variants, such as this one, G6, that are capable of, of catalyzing reactions that were thought to be quite difficult, such as the coupling of this uh, you know, electron poor indole um, uh, with, with serine, okay. Um, so that's my first example. Uh, and let me move on to a recent application uh, that we've steered orthorep towards, um, especially in the context of this pandemic, which is the evolution of antibodies. So the goal here is to use orthorep to streamline the generation of antibodies that bind custom targets, right? And you can imagine that streamlining of antibody generation is important and valuable because you want antibodies against virtually anything that you can imagine. And so the simple approach that we took here is just to do yeast display from orthogonal replication. And so you can imagine how this works. We encode proteins such as antibodies and nanobodies on orthorep. We display them on the surface. And now the displayed protein, the displayed antibody is self-diversifying. And then we simply culture these cells and uh, sort for binding of uh, custom targets via fax with the advantage that once you sort your winners, 
you just culture them again and sort again, and you can get improvements of affinity over time. Okay, this is a very streamlined way essentially to affinity mature antibodies. And so, uh, because it's streamlined, we can go after many targets starting from many different starting points. Uh, here are the experiments that we've done and are doing in the lab. Uh, this is in collaboration with Andrew Cruz's lab at Harvard Med School and Debbie Marx's lab at Harvard Med School. Um, and uh, I'll highlight a couple of successes from this list. So kind of the uh, first experiment we did was to evolve nanobodies against a GPCR called AT1R. Uh, this is before the COVID era. And if you look at this, we're just mapping the mutations that appear at different rounds of this cycle. And so you see, of course, emergence of mutations that we think improve inf affinity, and then emergence of additional mutations on top of those backgrounds, resulting in high affinity nanobodies against AT1R. Um, if you look at these nanobodies, indeed, they do, the evolved nanobodies do increase activity or do increase in affinity. Um, and in uh, assays that are actually uh, measuring their ability to recognize specific confirmations of AT1R, here the, the agonist bound confirmation of AT1R, you see that we have confirmationally specific nanobodies. Uh, and in this kind of uh, experiment, you also see kind of the influence of epistasis, right? Like this mutation Y113H isn't increasing the affinity of the wild type starting nanobody by much uh, or at all in this assay, um, but it does so when it's put on the background of these other mutations, okay? So this kind of effect is one of the outcomes of uh, continuous evolution that allows you kind of further and more in-depth searches of fitness landscapes. Um, once, uh, uh, you know, the COVID crisis began, we steered this project towards evolution of nanobodies against um, basically the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and in particular, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And so let me describe this experiment. We first started with a naive library of nanobodies, and we just selected for clones with affinity for RBD. Okay. And once we had a collection of clones, we uh, put those individually onto OrthoRep and started running independent affinity maturation experiments. This is kind of a uh, important feature of OrthoRep um, that exploits its scale uh, because you can imagine that if you had mixed all of these affinity, high affinity, uh, naive clones, you know, one would inevitably take over, right? Kind of the greedy mutational paths would take over and you would suppress everything else. But because we can address each clone individually, in affinity maturation experiments, that doesn't happen, and we can have a greater diversity of outcomes, and perhaps those outcomes all target different epitopes. And so here's just a highlight of the process for one of these clones. Uh, these are fax traces, where over different rounds of culturing and fax sorting, um, we actually see the emergence of new mutations. So the uh, basic summary of these fax graphs is that this uh, x-axis here is a measure of how well it binds this RBD target. So you want to shift the population to the right. And what you see is after the first fax round, we're pulling out a new population that has improved its affinity uh, all the while we're dropping the amount of uh, target we're adding to challenge the selection further. And you see that, oh, you know, in the next fax round, another uh, mutant looks like it's creating a population that's fixing. And then this occurs over and over again. And we're uh, almost done with this experiment where we think we've reached a plateau at around uh, fax 11 or so. 
Um, if you uh, look at the actual mutants that are fixing, uh, this is from post-fax 4, so it's even an earlier harvesting of what has uh, evolved, and presumably we have stuff that's further improved, but already these are getting to be pretty good nanobodies. Um, so the clone parent has a rather low affinity for RBD, but our mutants that have multiple mutations in them have improved their affinity over the parent. Um, I'm just masking these mutations because uh, some companies are um, uh, interested in licensing these so uh, that we can actually deploy them in um, a useful scenario. But basically, if you look at these clones, right, clone 10-9 uh, and 10-10 have very nice binding curves for RBD, uh, where the uh, EC50 is in the nanomolar range, um, SPR measurements are in progress, and pseudovirus assays on these uh, antibodies um, show neutralization activity. Um, so this is just one slice of this project. Uh, we have six other evolution campaigns that are uh, successful in terms of a similar uh, progression of uh, mutational fixation events and evolution um, towards higher and higher affinities for RBD binding. So all of those nanobodies are now being characterized and uh, tested against each other, as well as mapped for the epitopes that they find. Um, so our next goal in this project as kind of a general platform for antibody evolution is to remove the fax machine altogether. And we are working um, uh, to establish a cell-cell communication signal where when you display the target antigen on a different yeast mating background, uh, once it binds to the antibody on the orthorep cell, it will stimulate its survival, right? So this is kind of like a germinal center, but made from yeast. And our hope is that we can just input uh, antigens into a culture of yeast, and then over just simple culturing of those cells, we'll get out a high affinity binding protein. So this is a direction that we're going in to even streamline antibody generation with orthorep further. Okay, so those are the two examples of orthorep that I want to give, to give you a flavor of what it can do. And I wanna end with kind of just a brief dis discussion of the value of orthorep in the context of the directed evolution field. So uh, we all know what directed evolution is, and we're all familiar, I think, with this general pipeline of doing directed evolution, where you essentially take genes of interest, you mutate them in a test tube, you clone them into cells, and then you apply selection and you repeat the cycle. And this pipeline makes sense because you can uh, see it as a way of breaking this genomic error threshold constraint that I talked about earlier, right? In vitro, you can achieve very high rates of mutagenesis uh, because you're not constrained by what the genome requires. And so uh, you get these complex libraries, but then you have to put these libraries uh, into cells so that they express protein and you can actually couple them to selection. Uh, so this constant uh, going back and forth between in vitro and in vivo uh, steps of the procedure are what define directed evolution campaigns. Um, but because of this back and forth between in vitro and in vivo steps, you actually limit yourself from accessing two types of experiments that I, I think are very important for the field going forward. So I characterize these as experiments requiring depth and experiments requiring scale, right? Because of this process, uh, you can't traverse very long mutational pathways. Each time you do this cycle, it's quite, quite a burden. Um, and so, you know, you do this a few cycles and you get tired and you don't want to go further. Um, the second type of experiment that is difficult to do with the cycle is, is our, our experiments requiring scale, right? It's very difficult to do many experiments simultaneously and replicates of even an individual evolution experiment if you have to manually address all these steps for each line that is independently evolving. 
And so uh, OrthoRep enables a mode of evolution uh, that many others are also working on called continuous evolution, where the kind of uh, um, the you know, the prototypical scheme is that you're just resisting dilution, right? Just like normal evolution in nature, all you're doing is passaging cells under selective environments and then the ones that can outcompete, uh, you know, the others in the population will take over. And so continuous evolution replaces the stepwise process of direct evolution with a more natural one that is streamlined and as a result, you can access great depth in evolutionary search. You can do this uh, indefinitely with, with not too much trouble. And you can access high degrees of scale um, because if you're just culturing cells, you can do that in many replicates or in many independent experiments of different types. And the depth and scale in evolutionary search, I think, has some significance. Uh, one uh, uh, reason for achieving depth in evolutionary search is, of course, to go after ambitious functions. So uh, if you have a function that um, is quite far away from your starting point or is quite hard to achieve, you can imagine it'll require long mutational paths to get there. And so if you can actually search long mutational paths, you can reach these functions. Um, another reason that you want depth in evolutionary search is because uh, there's always this problem in evolution that you can get stuck in local optima. And one way out of local optima is if you can fluctuate or change your selection. For instance, a simple case would be relaxing your selection so you can drift more and then you can impose stronger selection to climb new hills. Um, and that kind of experiment is by definition going to require many generations. And so only systems that are able to explore long mutational paths can access this kind of a procedure. Um, you know, on the other end of scale, you can imagine why this is useful. Um, so one thing that I didn't show you, but that we've done in the context of drug resistance is to use OrthoRep to just replicate the evolution of drug resistance in many, uh, in, in, in many replicates in order to detect rare ways that you can actually develop resistance. And so this gives you a better sense of how many solutions there are to a particular evolutionary problem. Um, you can also imagine that scale is important as an evolution modality. Uh, if you have many related activities that you want from a single starting point, right? Antibodies are an example of this. Uh, trip B was an example of this. So I think you get the idea. Um, there's also an idea of using spatial structure in protein evolution experiments that now become available to continuous evolution modes um, where uh, spatial structure can be even used to escape local optima by preventing clonal interference and greedy mutational searches. And finally, one area that we're developing um, quite heavily in my lab is simply using OrthoRep to just generate a lot of evolutionary diversity. Uh, and uh, the promise there is that if you have enough evolutionary diversity on a given protein, all constrained by functional requirements for that protein, then you can feed computation, uh, which in the machine learning age um, requires a lot of data. But it's very productive in that if you have enough data, you can have a computer learn quite a bit, bit of uh, sequence function relations um, from, uh, for your protein. Okay, so, um, that's where I think uh, the field is headed and where we are focusing on efforts and all of our experiments now kind of exploit these two themes. And with that, um, I'd like to conclude and acknowledge the members of the lab uh, who did the work. Um, Antibody Project was led by uh, Alon Wellner, um, Gordon, uh, 
was responsible for the Trip B project I showed. Uh, Jonathan and Jake um, were involved in the antibody evolution experiment. Our collaborators, Francis and uh, Andrew, um, for the Trip B and uh, uh, antibody work are listed here. And um, let me thank you also for your attention. Uh, and I'll take any questions in the next session. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Chang. Uh, great to see uh, Ultharet being put to use in this pandemic. I was hoping we'd hear about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> really exciting I stuff. Think, uh, yeah, there, there are. And thank you also at the beginning for really um, ramming home about the, the differences in scale of mutation rate uh, on genes versus genomes. And I think that's a really important point for our debate. So I'm going to go uh, into, oh, let me go. I'm going to share the screen first now. You, sorry, that's just to show something briefly before we get going uh, on the uh, panels, which, uh, is that there is a, uh, I was asked if I could show this to people, that um, students, uh, no, researchers at Edinburgh University are considering uh, starting something equivalent to iGEM, but specifically around uh, directed evolution as a competition. So this is something for people to bear in mind if this is a subject that interests you a lot, uh, directed evolution. Uh, the various different methods and technologies to do it, things like orthorep uh, or the methods used by um, Phil's group or the Arnold group, for example, then please um, get in contact with these guys. Uh, you can see the email here, and I can tweet this as well afterwards so that people can uh, get this. Uh, Yang Lu at Edinburgh is, is really leading this idea, and they're interested in whether something like Biomod or iGEM could exist for students to compete in, in directed evolution projects and develop new directed evolution technologies. I just thought I'd, I'd give that a plug before we move to our panel session and our debate. And so the, I've changed the background here um, to give a bit more information here. We're going to start with some pictures from some of the people who are now joining us, joining our speakers on the panel. Um, and uh, we'd like you uh, to use the Q&A function if you're, if you're watching this to ask questions for us to debate and particularly to use the little thumb logo on Zoom to upvote the questions you think are the most important ones to, for us to debate. Chang's gonna has some questions directed to him in the Q&A. Um, he's probably not gonna have time before the debate to answer all of those, um, but maybe during uh, Victor, Erica, and Mark's pitches, he can, ha he can have a look at that if, if he's got time. But we'll, we'll be mostly using the, uh, the Q&A function now for the questions on the debate. So let me pass over now to uh, Victor, who's the first of our panelists, Victor De Lorenzo. All Over right. To you. Do you want to tell people who you are and why you're interested in this topic yes, in particular? Certainly. Um, yes. This is... I can see your, uh, your screen. And yeah, well, we, we, good afternoon. Um, everyone, it's a pleasure being with you uh, today. Uh, this is obviously a topic that is very close to my heart because for a long time we have been trying to use genetic engineering to develop uh, agents for environmental bioremediation. I work in the National Center of Biotechnology in Madrid and um, uh, like 15 years ago we found uh, a tremendous opportunity to boost the uh, field with the tools of synthetic biology. So that's uh, why uh, we became uh, interested in this whole story. But also, um, uh, we face constantly the fact that you go to the laboratory, you create something interesting there in terms of genetic engineering, one strain that degrades this or that, and then after a while, the strain stops working simply because it has mutated and evolution has made its job, and then everything goes down. So that's why at some point um, I um, became very, very uh, interested to see whether we can really um, develop some concepts on how to handle at the same time, the benefits of evolution and the benefits of directed uh, synthetic biology and genetic engineering. Uh, let me start this little uh, initiation of the discussion with this quotation by Drew Endy. It's a famous quotation or an infamous quotation, if you wish, saying that engineers hate complexity. I hate emerging properties. I like simplicity. I don't want the plane I take tomorrow to have emerging properties while it's flying. So this uh, puts in black and white 
one of the main say issues uh, when you um, put together synthetic biology and all the aspirations and ambitions to develop a um, robust synthetic and, um, and biological um, systems, uh, bioengineering and all the rest of it. At the same time, the problem of evolution, how do we deal with this? So uh, let me just um, propose for a discussion a few uh, say points that are uh, close to my interest. Um, uh, and let me start by saying that, well, um, I don't think that the um, um, conundrum or the paradox evolution versus design is a solved issue at all. I think that we have we don't have the right theoretical framework to really put the two things together. At some point, we rely entirely on evolution. And I think that we just heard a very, very good talk about that. In other cases, we prefer to go all the way to um, uh, direct engineering, and it has some benefits and some counter benefits. But you know, we live with these two words, and uh, there's some contradiction or some say tension between the two uh, approaches. Then um, I detect, and I don't know whether the audience would agree with me, I would have a serious semantic problem. So sometimes when people coming from the two fields discuss about evolution, I am not sure that we understand the same meaning <coughs> for the same word, words. <coughs> Things such as uh, fitness, um, diversity, um, um, a, a fitness landscape. Um, I mean, we all uh, use all the time uh, terms that I'm not sure that we all agree with the specific uh, meaning. And that's something that, um, uh, well, I think we have some homework to do uh, to develop some semantic standards. And then, um, if you want to turn around a bit the, 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 the discussion about uh, uh, design and, and evolution or engineering and evolution, well, I could argue that perhaps uh, they both converge in the pursuit of uh, a solution uh, to a a multi-objective optimization challenge. And uh, well, if, if, if there are many cases in the literature and in, in, the, in the biology and engineer, where at the end of the day, uh, both from, if you take the problem from, uh, from an evolutionary perspective and also from a purely engineering technological perspective, they all converge in the very, very same solution. I think that this is something that we have to think about because um, in terms of the theory that covers this situation, there's not much developed on that to the best of my knowledge. And also, and this is a thing that is the, 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 the key point, is that evolution is that's something that engineers so far do very poorly and is to handle a large number of parameters. So engineers are very good to um, develop parts or identifying parts and to develop a good layout of the parts to uh, deliver a given, uh, say, performance. But then we are not very good at uh, predicting and putting the right parameters. So when you have a very, very large number of parameters with a lot of variation. So far, the only solution or the best solution is to rely in some engineering, in, in some evolutionary approach, as we, has, as we have just heard in the previous talk. So um, developing directly with from first principle, uh, first, uh, first principles, an antibody an anti, uh, able to bind a new antigen would be very difficult. However, through evolutionary techniques, uh, one can find a solution to the problem. So I just uh, stop here. I just wanted to share with you some um, points for discussion, and I will stop at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Victor. That was great, and some really good talking points. I was writing them down. <laughs> Things we can debate. So uh, is is Erica there? Oh yeah, there's Erica, and I can see your video. So I'll spotlight you, so you can take the floor next. So Erica's calling in from Colorado right now where the wildfire that was 35 miles from my house is now fully contained as of yesterday, I'm pleased to say. Um, okay, so contained, that's good. Yes. You're, yeah, um, no you're a little quiet for me, so I don't know if you can... Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I'm not sure... You I can, can adjust your microphone or speak a little louder? Yeah, I'm not sure I can do much about that, to be honest. Um, I'll just put my volume up then. All right, apologies for that. Uh, so, I'm an assistant professor of rhetoric of science, um, at Colorado State University and a member of the microbiome cluster. So I do most of the interdisciplinary work with scientists. I'm just starting my second year here and before moving to Colorado, I was a postdoc in science, technology and innovation studies at the University of Edinburgh, where I worked with the synthetic yeast project and got to know the directed evolution system known as Scramble, which I suspect most of you have heard of. Um, my pitch is that I love the idea of designing with evolution and I love it for three reasons. First, it opens up an alternative to the idea that good biodesign always must mean making biological systems more and more like machines. 
and Victor just mentioned, machines don't do evolution very well. Biological systems do. So often responses to this intractable challenge of biological complexity are essentially that we should make biological systems less complex, that bioengineers need to work to make biology more like non-living engineerable systems. I'm actually tremendously interested in the possibility of reframing biological complexity as a resource to be leveraged rather than a problem to be solved, and thinking about designing with the unique affordances of biological systems rather than trying to squash or silence or erase them to make them more like machines. And biological systems can be imperfect machines, but they can be really good biological systems. So let's use them for what they're good for. And it seems to me that engineering with evolution involves asking how these you know, more or less unique capacities of biological systems, microbes especially, could be tools. In other words, it makes space for thinking creatively about how bioengineering might take a very different trajectory than, say, engineering microchips or automobiles, which is one of those comparisons you hear all the time that bioengineering is so far behind engineering automobiles, engineering microchips, and we need to fix that. Well, to my mind, we're making the wrong comparison. Let's get off the idea that there's one trajectory for engineering systems and imagine that bioengineering takes a different trajectory and an engineering evolution is a strategy for exploiting a different trajectory. The second reason I really like the idea of engineering with evolution is that it involves the word with. With is one of my favorite words. Um, but I think it's important to make two distinctions here. And one is really highlighted by the talks we've heard today that I think a lot of what we've been hearing about is engineering evolution rather than engineering with evolution. So designing better systems for evolving or designing different systems that can evolve rather than using evolution to design systems. Um, and that's a distinction that I don't think is, is hard and fast. Clearly these two things work together, but they're working in slightly different directions and one of them serves the other. The second distinction I think we need to make is about the way that we're using the word with if we're talking about engineering with evolution. Uh, Here's my favorite example. I can make a pasta sauce with tomatoes. I can make a pasta sauce with my favorite wooden spoon, or I can make a pasta sauce with my mother. These are very clearly three different uses of the word with. The tomatoes are an ingredient, the spoon is a tool, and my mother is a partner or a collaborator in shared work. And I don't want to get these up. Uh, so we might be talking about engineering with evolution as an ingredient, and I think in some cases we are, as in at this stage in my protocol or in my recipe, I need to add some random mutation and functional selection. Or we might be talking about evolution as a tool, which I think would seem to be a better metaphor insofar as evolution is a process. So we're going to say we're going to use evolution to identify you know, the smallest possible transcription factor in this particular setting in the same way, same way that I might use my spoon to stir my sauce. Uh, but we might also be talking about engineering with evolution as a design partner, as in, at this stage, I'm going to ask evolution to do some of the work, as Phil so nicely demonstrated for me at the beginning of this session, we're going to let nature do the hard work for us. Um, I'm going to delegate to evolution to figure out part of the solution to this design problem for me. And this brings me to the third reason why I really like the idea of engineering with evolution. And that's that it's a possible challenge to this ideal that good engineering should always mean controlling everything. Um, and the quote that Victor put up from Drew Enby is a really good example of how bioengineering might be quite different than a lot of other forms of engineering. Though planes aren't always the best example because we don't actually understand a lot of how planes work. Um, but the potential successes of engineering with evolution suggest that randomness combined with the complex and intrinsically intertwined apparatus of a cell in its environment, or other biological unit for that matter, um, is at least sometimes more effective than thinking for producing design solutions. And I always think about something that Drew, Doug Densmore often says in his talks. When Doug Densmore talks about cello, uh, he says that running a lot of random experiments is cheaper than thinking for him to characterize the system that is cello. Uh, so one of the things that I find interesting here is the possibility of giving up some determined control over identifying exactly how a system works, and instead relying on the capacity of a complex um, underdefined system to evolve a solution for a design problem. We can think about giving a bacteria or Saccharomyces cerevisiae a design problem in the form of a challenging environment, asking it to come up with a solution to that problem, or in other words, employing its, its in, intrinsic capacity to evolve, to figure out a way to survive in this environment. I'm anthropomorphizing, but you get my, you get my point. Um, and then 
using that design solution without necessarily understanding how it works. And as far as I can tell, when Phil said that evolution is an emergent property of all information carrying polymers, I think what he's talking about is that all information carrying polymers whose replication is error prone are subject to selection on the basis of perhaps their capacity to interact with its polymerase, which might also be changing uh, in an environment comprised of the polymerase, the temperature, the other settings controlled, or the other parameters of the environment controlled by the scientist. And as far as I can tell, the same parameters are involved when we ask a yeast to try to figure out how to grow at 40 degrees better than it usually does, uh, except that we don't understand how it works. And maybe we don't need to understand how it works. We can figure out a design solution that works via evolution through all of the things that are changing without us necessarily being able to, able to identify all of those things. So here's the final question I can't answer. This is the thing that always comes up, it seems, when I talk about releasing some element of control over design to biological systems or letting the bacteria do the work. Someone invariably replies with a concern about risk management. Whether the discussion is about therapeutics of the human gut or fears that synthetic yeast can become a bioterrorism agent, the worry always seems to be that if scientists don't characterize and control every element of biodesign, it might accidentally turn into something dangerous and then you know ruin everyone's life because they can't do science anymore and maybe hurt someone. Now, as far as I can tell, not being a synthetic biologist myself, this fear seems silly because first, it's very rare for a system to be perfectly characterized and controlled irrespective of the design strategy behind it. And second, if the design strategy is working with the typical inclinations of microbes, we know that most microbes aren't out to kill us most of the time. Um, and third, we have lots of historical evidence to suggest that completely control-oriented strategies are also error-prone and sometimes produce harmful mistakes. However, I still want to know, what do I say to someone who asks, why is it safe to engineer with evolution? And I hate that question because I don't think that it's especially well-founded um, for the few reasons I just mentioned, but it always comes up. So I think that it should probably be part of the part of the discussion. That's my pitch. Thank you for the pitch. That's definitely mute myself. That's definitely something we should have in the discussion. That's uh, very good. So, Erica, that was brilliant. And now I'll I'll put Mark on the spotlight, our last panelist to introduce himself. Mark is a colleague of mine at Imperial College London, so not too far away from me right now, probably. And uh, you have Hello, a short... Can you see my screen? Yeah. Great, so, so my pitch is uh, actually very closely related to Chang Lu's uh, presentation, but it's more for a, a cry for help for something like Authorep um, for E. coli rather than uh, yeast, because it's something that that field, I, I believe, is, is sorely missing. And I'll give you an example uh, of that. Um, we were inspired by David Liu's work a few years ago on PACE, uh, where he basically made a system that phage conditionally replicate if they can replace a missing part of the phage replication cycle. And we made our own version of this, which we called PACE mid uh, after PACE. The main difference being the mid bit that we use plasmids, um, uh, we, uh, um, we use um, phage mids rather than classic phage for a number of engineering reasons because they're, they're much more easy uh, to work with. But the, the principle behind all of these technologies is that you have something missing in the phage, a missing phage gene, and you have something that you want to engineer, for example, a new uh, transcription factor that you want to interact with a new DNA sequence. And if these things interact, they express the missing phage gene they complete the life cycle, new phage is created, it infects new bacteria. And so this drives an evolutionary process where you get more and more phage viruses, better and better at carrying out this function and completing the phage uh, life cycle. What we have found works quite well, particularly with this phage mid system, is to start off with libraries, um, which you can build on the phage mid plasmids, but it's a hassle, it's a, a lot of work. And what you really want is true directed evolution, which has spontaneous, continuous mutagenesis as part of the evolutionary uh, function. So what we have done is take this system, 
build an evolution robot that does it very much to the, the uh, similar to the PACE system. That's shown in, in this figure. Uh, you've got here actually a bunch of um, pipes uh, carrying media from container to container. In one container, you have chemostats growing bacteria. Downstream, you have these lagoons which grow the phage. And as they evolve to become better and better phage through the function, this uh, uh, chamber enriches uh, with uh, new uh, phage. And we've been able to put in kind of random mutagenesis uh, functions, but there are huge disadvantages with doing that. Whereas something like orthorep, um, I'm very jealous of that, that it specifically uh, mutates with great accuracy the particular target gene that you want to mutate. We don't really have the functional equivalent yet in these bacterial systems. What we have been able to do with this kind of robotic evolution is to do some proof of principles. Um, we've been able to, for example, to uh, engineer this very tiny 63 amino acid peptide um, that is both a transcription activator and a transcription repressor. And it has some random mutagenesis in this continuous evolution system that you can see at these green points. It's actually used a mixture of uh, starting combinatorial library plus some random uh, mutagenesis. But this is very, very slow and inefficient in, in the kind of implementation we're cu currently doing it doing. And what I want to, to show is what we're using. Uh, this is not at all to disrespect David Liu's work, but we're very much inspired by it, but we're using his mutagenesis plasmids, which effectively randomly increase the mutagenesis rate in the entire bacterial cell. So the, the kind of cry for help, the pitch that I'm, I'm making here, is we need something that will specifically and tunably uh, create this one or two mutations per cell, per generation, just on the target gene and not the genome. And this would transform a lot within bacterial uh, directed evolution because other parts of bacterial directed evolution work really, really well. Um, they've been worked on for many, many years and it's probably one of the mo most robust systems for selecting all kinds of things um, from enzymes to antibody interactions to protein DNA interactions. So it would be a shame to not to be able to exploit this fully. And that's why I think um, this is something that really needs to be worked on. There are a few solutions out there. There are a few papers. You may have come across things such as T7 aid fusions or uh, error prone pol one directed to particular uh, starting or replication starts. Um, but there is nothing really robust out there that works. So that's the end of my pitch. And if anyone has any brilliant ideas, uh, I'm listening. Thanks. Great. Awesome, Mark. So uh, hopefully someone can give you some ideas. Right. So uh, we're now on to the panel uh, part of the, uh, of the talk. So if you get out of that, that's perfect. So if I go into gallery view now, we should start seeing our panelists appear. And if the speakers are still around and want to join us, Tammy, Chang and Phil, that would be brilliant as well. Uh, let me see. So Tammy's on mute at the moment. Chang is probably still busy answering some questions in the Q&A. <laughs> and, uh, and Phil may have uh, uh, gone along uh, to something else. It's been, oh no, he's here as well. So we've got six and uh, I think people should be seeing the six of us or seven of us up now on the screen to talk through some of the questions. So if you're an attendee watching on this, please um, if you have a question you want the panel to debate, um, you can go to the Q&A, put that in, and uh, if you see good ones and upvote them, I think um, some of my helpers here will pass them on to me in the chat and then I can uh, and ask those. But if everyone can hear me okay, I'm gonna start with the first question, just generally to everyone, bit of a big question here. If we were to um, be looking to be able to engineer with evolution, um, and you can define that how you want, in, uh, in 20 years from now, as well as we can engineer biology like we do in synthetic biology from modular parts, where would you fund uh, development? What, what money, where would you put the money into to be able to be engineering with evolution? Uh, and I I'll go to Victor first for that, because Victor, you're never short of things to discuss. 
Well, thank you. Uh, you know, someone said that um, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And I have the impression that, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my little um, inter intervention, um, uh, we really lack some uh, semantic standards. So I think that one thing is directed evolution or evolution for engineering. That's one, what you may call a branch of uh, evolution that can be very beneficial and very good for scientific biology. And a different type, a different thing is uh, evolution, I don't know, in the way they, the, the animal experts and, and, and you know, um, the zoologists and everything uh, understand. So I don't know whether you see these kind of different uh, dimensions, but you know, I, um, I dislike the term directed evolution because I would say that by definition, evolution cannot be directed. If it is directed, it's not evolution. It's a different thing, it's wonderful. It solves many problems, but it may not be evolution in, in, in the strict sense. That would be my kind of reaction. So you, you, you go for theory. To that, Tom? Yeah, sure. Just really briefly, I have to point out, when I mentioned that there are three different definitions of width, at least, semantic ambiguity is often a part of biology and often really useful. And I actually think we should preserve it, not get rid of it. Evelyn Fox Keller, who's like my favorite person in the world, she's a rhetorician of science and a historian of science at MIT, has pointed out that often there are multiple definitions of gene and genome in the same paper. She's listed at least five of them each. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's a problem. I think that it's actually an affordance that this one term can contain lots of different approaches so we don't get bottlenecked in one way of doing a thing. We instead have an umbrella that allows for a lot of diversity. And that's positive. Phil, we haven't heard from you for a while, so what, what would you, what would be your take? Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> so if, if, we will, if we want to get to a point where, you know, we really are using evolution in our, when we're trying to engineer biology to do solutions for it, or we are using evolution instead of engineering when we're trying to work with biology to solve solutions, what would we be, where would we prioritize funding and investment now to achieve that in the next 20 years? Well, I mean, clearly, I mean, you know, we've seen, I think Jangslu is a great, great example um, uh, of, you know, beginning to get control over where mutations go, but that's certainly part of the story uh, of evolution, you know, in, in, in biology. For example, you know, it would be great to be able to control recombination as well. Uh, and in fact, you know, the immune system actually starts with recombination, you know, to get to a point where you have some function and then you come with, in with random mutations to, you know, to, to, to refine. So in fact, um, um, I mean, clearly random mutations kind of works very well, but it probably works well, you know, you know, when you start from something that's already folded or already has some, um, you know, slight kind of, you know, degree of function. <clears throat> so that would be one thing, you know, to be able to control that. And then clearly you would like to be able to control exactly where you recombine, what you recombine, and when you mutate, what you mutate, to what degree, and maybe with whatever bias you would like um, to do. And then finally, you know, if one can dream, I would love to combine that with expanding the chemistry that biology can handle, uh, both at the level of, you know, nucleic acids, you know, maybe an expanded genetic alphabet and then an expanded genetic code. And um, Chang, I'm gonna to come to you next because Phil was talking there pretty much about technologies that would be whole genome wide recombination and the yeah. effects of that. And you, you, you touched well, upon that. Not necessarily. In there could be, they could be focused on plasmids or genetic elements or, you know, transposons, um, you name it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, a matter of the scale of the functions you want, right? I mean, certainly for cellular functions, um, <clears throat> you just care about what the cell does and doing genome-wide evolution experiments is very uh, directed toward, toward those goals. Um, I do think that in cellular evolution, because you have so many proteins that can contribute to an adaptation, you do have like clonal interference between what directions a particular experiment will take. So there may also be value in like switching where in a cell you can target mutation to, where you're gonna focus your effort on at different stages of the project. 
but all of the above I think will be useful. I mean, another uh, point I want to add is that, you know, we see, um, and now we're explicitly exploiting recombination between uh, versions of our orthogonal plasmid, and we're coupling that now with yeast mating so that you can do kind of a higher level of mutagenesis where you're combining only good mutations. Um, and then maybe I can touch on uh, uh, the, the original question a little bit, which is that, you know, ultimately, right, like I think all of us have to admit that if we can just computationally design everything with great accuracy, then that'll be better than evolving anything. Um, but I think we're far from that. And perhaps we're far from that because the complexity of biology is of such uh, greatness that, you know, well, maybe quantum computers will one day solve it, but, you know, you, you just can't sample that infinite space computationally very well. And you're down to basically search policies of how you search this infinite space. And evolution has pr provided many examples of good search methods through these infinite landscapes. Um, and one of my uh, uh, guiding uh, goals is, uh, as you saw from the talk, and um, I'll elaborate on it a little bit more, is that if you can control the parameters of evolution, but still let the, you know, random search process of evolution go, um, then you kind of can find a happy medium. Interesting. Well, so let's let's imagine that the uh, the post, some some rich billionaire decides to found a foundation that funds all of this work. So let's say um, Tim Cook or someone, or or as some president calls him, Tim Apple. Um, he will probably also want to fund, or they will want to fund um, some foundational research that helps us better understand engineering. So uh, Tammy, can you talk? What do you think are the best um, systems for us to try and observe and understand uh, and research to be able to get a better feeling about how we would engineer with evolution? So I, I'm, I, I'm just I'm still maybe a little confused on the, on the end goal, right? Are we trying to use yeah. evolution as a tool to, 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 to make evolution? I, I think there was an earlier question about you know, letting the system then evolve on, on its own. Um, So I got a little distracted. Um, I could I could clarify that. So yeah. probably in the in the nearer term, maybe within ten years or so, we might want to be considering, you know, a, a an engineered cell that, for example, could go in the gut microbiome that would be designed taking into account what we think are the trajectories of its evolution when it's in the gut microbiome, um, so that it it performs better over time, and so that we don't have to worry about it just conking out over time instead. But then maybe in 20 years from now, we will be so good at this that we won't necessarily sit down and design and build a biotechnological biotech cell. We will instead have tools, kind of the equivalent to CRISPR, which can kind of nudge evolution within certain cells that we desire uh, within a system into the, the phenotypes that we want to achieve. Yeah. So I'm scared about all of these suggestions. <laughs> so so uh, because you know, when you put something into a complex ecosystem, it doesn't do what you think you're asking it to do, right? You have to design the fitness, op the, the objective function, right, of, of an evolution. And when you're doing a directed evolution experiment, like um, some, some of the ones we heard about today, you know, you can very clearly define what that goal is, right? I want better binding um, to this protein, right? And um, what we find is that, you know, if we give a, a bacteria the capacity to evolve, you know, um, you know, if you make a chemostat and you try to get the, or a morbidostat and try to get them to evolve higher antibiotic resistance, right? What they actually evolve to is to stick better to the edge of the tubes to avoid the flow through um, that's happening in your chemostat. And so, um, I think I think the key for any of these things is going to be ensuring that that the tools that we give it to give an organism to maybe evolve at a faster rate in its natural system are very constrained, right? To only doing something we want it to do. And so I, I in many ways, maybe the goal would be to, to avoid, avoid evolution, right? And um, 
So I, I don't know. That's just one perspective. Of course, I wanted to say that let's think about, you know, having a system that evolves to avoid phage and whatnot. Um, but um, I think in many ways, um, well, I think in the synthetic biology, we've been trying that for quite a while, right? And, and biotechnology in general. I mean, can we right. develop cells that have lower mutation rates, lower recombinations, and avoid phage? And to some extent, it's it's a like a losing battle, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's easy to engineer and write, but evolution and mutation and selection is is going to be against us. I think one thing that I think someone else has has commented on this before is probably our best solution so far is to is to make this the bacteria it's normally bacteria it's to make them an offer they can't refuse sort of like a be like the the godfather and say like here you go here's the bit of dna and if if you don't express this in the right way then you don't survive uh and that that forces them to do the task right, so I, th I think yeah like kill switches and, and things and things are great um and then i think another thing might be enabling different life cycles, so right? And enabling some sort of dormancy and engineering in uh, dormancy into systems so that they can uh, deal with a perturbation uh, for a temporary period of time. Um, oh, While I'm on you, I, I, Sorry. Erica, you go ahead. No, 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 if you. I just, another question I was gonna come to, but I think, Tammy, you'd be well placed to answer this, was, was is, is it a case of engineering or evolution? And is it, is it that the engineering can get to the something like the end goal a lot quicker, with, especially with genetic engineering um, capabilities? And yet, I mean, you touched upon in your, your talk how long the evolution experiments can sometimes be and how, how painful that could be to do the kind of Richard Lensky style work uh, of long experiments. What are your thoughts on the sort of timescales of being able to engineer versus being able to evolve? So uh, I think that to, to pick up that question, we may want to return to the discussion we um, started before on computation versus evolution. So, and, and as Chang said, uh, you know, we use evolution because we don't have a, a computer that is good enough to, to do the job. So, and I think that what, is, what uh, that is telling us is that in fact, we are using the computational power of evolution uh, to solve a problem. So what you have in your in your in your you know petri dish or or or, or culture is a real computer that uh, takes inputs and you can raise questions and uh, put together problems and eventually they will find a solution because they have this amazing ability to scan a very very dense solution space a, a, a much a much much um, finer a solution space than any computer. So, and eventually, uh, you know, the two things may go together. So I think that at the end of the day, um, biological systems are computers. Maybe they use a different type of, of computation. They use, uh, they don't use Turing machines. They use different principles. Um, some people call um, heterotic computing, you know, when you embody a problem in a physical object and then the, the, the system fluctuates until it finds a solution. So, but I think that, you know, at the end, what uh, Chen Chang and others uh, like him um, uh, are, are doing is to use the biological system as a computer, as a real computer, able to deliver answers to specific problems. I, I think what's going to come in the short term already, and Chang alluded to that, is, I mean, currently you would type a, let's say, a hundred amino acid protein sequence and ask a computer, does this make any sense? Um, is that going to fold? Is that going to have a function? Neither the, neither the best computer nor you know, any scientist would be able to tell. But with the amount of feedback from the sort of totality of all the sequencing projects, plus evolutionary data coming out of you know, Chang's work, and you know, maybe you know, once, you, once you start kind of putting that data in, I think you know, my, my guess is kind of, you know, and and in fact, I know people are working on that. You know, you will be able to answer that question pretty soon, even with the computing power that we have. And that's clearly a start. Yeah, I mean, the way I see it is that um, the, uh, so if you look at what computers have been very good at in terms of, uh, say, machine learning, um, 
you know, you can, right, you see all these examples of computers beating human players at games. And one of the things with games is that the objective function is very well defined and a computer can accurately simulate the objective function. Whereas the objective function of a biological, uh, you know, of a protein doing some, some, some work um, is something that a computer can't simulate well, right? So reality is the physics engine that we want to work in. And on the one hand, if computers can simulate reality, then they should be able to do protein engineering faster. Um, but that is a tall order. And I think one of the uh, hopes is that as we get more evolutionary data, we can figure out uh, better ways to simulate reality in terms of sequence function relationships and kind of perhaps even reduce the dimensionality of the problem to a point where we can program a computer to get the most important things uh, in its simulation. And then you have this nice uh, synergy between you know, running experiments at a, in a scalable fashion in the laboratory to help define objective functions and then having computers use objective functions that can even pr predict new sequences and then use new sequences, evolve them in reality and use what is found there to rehome those objective functions. So I, I think it'll be a two-way street for at least the foreseeable future. And, and Tom, maybe I can answer sort of your question, because I agree, I agree with the Chang said. And I, I, I think I was initially also trying to talk about objective functions in sort of a different role, right? And saying that I think part of the challenge uh, in letting evolution sort of run wild, right? And putting something that's going to evolve into the wild at a faster rate um, is that we can't define the objective function. And I think it's really challenging in a complex community. Right, we really don't want to do that in a complex community because then maybe my gut microbiome is going to be completely bacteroides fragilis, which is probably not going to be good for me. So, um, but I think a place where things could be, where, where in the short term, right, um, something that's going to continue to evolve could be useful would be something in a more isolated condition, right? So in some sort of fermenters, not only do you add kill switches, but you also have directed evolution to produce more or, or to breathe, just to grow faster or resist phage invasions that come into your fermenter. Um, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very scared about uh, doing such an, in, in an ecological system because I think we're so, uh, we're, we're, so, we're so in such an early days with these ecological systems anyway. Um, I don't know what will change in 20 years. Maybe, maybe we'll get it, but it, the, you know, the, the complexity is, is much, much larger than a single genome. Well, one of the common questions that's that's coming up in the Q and A is that at, at what point do we trade off doing so? Directed evolution is showing good success at solving individual problems, so small problems like an an enzyme converting uh, in into a new molecule. Um, where where at what point do we can we use directed evolution and evolutionary principles for being able to tackle more complex things, such as logic systems or, or um, multiple behaviors in cells, not just a single output. And I guess that relates to the objective functions as well. Uh, is, there, is there work out there looking at this more com the more complexity of use of directed evolution? Do you know, um, perhaps uh, Phil or Chang could, could um, start with the answers on this? Um, I mean, I, I think the problem is again the objective function. If you have a logic operation, what what is the objective function? Because you would need to simultaneously interrogate the system. Um, it's going to be very difficult because because for each, let's say, for each sort of logic output, there's probably a shortcut which you know evolution would like to take. I mean, I don't know, Chang, maybe you have some ideas, but I see that as really complicated. Yeah, I mean, the challenge is that the more complicated your objective function becomes, the easier it is to cheat, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly what I meant, yeah. I guess there, there has, uh, I, I'm not um, 
you know, well versed in this area, but I, I know of some work, uh, I think even from, you know, over a decade ago where um, you take, uh, you basically take like different circuit elements and just uh, scramble them <clears throat> and then select for logical operations. And, uh, you know, those have identified both kind of predictable circuit architectures and ones that work but are working in ways that are not clear. So I think, um, Mark, you just came back after dropping out. This is, this is kind of specifically similar to your area, right? So um, some of your research has used computation to work out, you know, all sort of random combinations of interactions that can lead to a specific um, output from cells. Well, in in your simple. case, it was Turing patterns. Yeah. So how, how would you achieve that with evolution and directed evolution? Um, directed evolution is much more powerful. And I think it's exactly as the other panelists said, when you have a really well-defined fitness function and objective function, you can do the exhaustive Atlas approach and model everything as we've done, for example, for um, French flag patterns, Turing patterns, uh, etc. But once you go beyond that, and, and even if you increase the number of nodes in the network you're trying to model, um, you very quickly just come across a, a combinatorial explosion. Um, I've always been a, a fan of, of directed evolution. I, I note Victor's objection to the word directed, but I, I think that, uh, I mean, for me, the directed bit is the selection pressure that you apply. You can apply this multi-objective selection pressure in any way you like. You can reduce the amount of targets. You can put competing decoy targets. Uh, so you can select in different directions. So I, I don't really have a, a problem with the directed bit of the, the directed uh, evolution. Um, but I do think that for the foreseeable future, unless as... Um, Chang said quantum computers come along, uh, there's going to be nothing better than uh, engineering evolution. I, I mean, you asked an interesting question a few minutes ago saying, where do you see this going in 10 years time? I think no one mentioned yet um, automation. Uh, I mean, a lot of these systems are already on the way to being automated, but I kind of imagine that if uh, you push billions of dollars into this kind of uh, field, you should really get to the point where you've got these highly automated systems, maybe even linked to DNA right systems and doing the evolution uh, for you as much as, as possible. But we're, yeah, at the moment, it's going to be much more case by case kind of project thing. Victor, do you have any, any thoughts on the complex systems, how we would get to the engineering or, or evolution trade-off with a complex system? Well, I think that eventually you have to live with the, with the best of the two worlds. So I think that as long as we are unable to handle too many parameters and to handle at the same time many objectives, we have to rely in the, uh, say, unconventional uh, computational power of, of, of um, um, evolution. But at the same time, you know, we can uh, take these parameters and these uh, partial solutions and to put them in, a, in an engineer a system. So I think that, um, you know, eventually the two fields will, will, come, will come together. I, I see, well, I see right now the, this tension between the two approaches, but I think that eventually the two will come along very, very well, as uh, to some extent are coming uh, uh, even today. Um, but, you know, in practical terms, you know, I'm, I'm a biotechnologist. So uh, for me, the pain in the neck is the fact of durability. I mean, that I, ha I have a construct and I want the construct to work for a long time. And damn it, you know, uh, like uh, after a few hours, the whole system stops working. I mean, I need a solution for that. So uh, this may not be a very scientifically well-formulated question, but this is the practical problem. And this is what will make a big difference in terms of the respect that other areas of science and engineer, engineering will have for synthetic biology, being able to deliver biological systems that are durable and predictable. I think that that's uh, the most important question, in my opinion. Erica? I'm just curious because this is a completely left field suggestion or question. Uh, but in the case of durability, is the problem that you don't have enough complexity rather than you have too much? Uh, that the more relationships 
any element of a system, regardless of what unit you're talking about forms, the more you could say checks and balances, but I don't like that because it's binary, but the more um, things it has surrounding it, ensuring that even if some part of it breaks, its function might be compensated for by another element of the system, if the system function that you're interested in is favorable for the overall function of the system. You know, if, if you're asking it to do something, it's a carrot instead of a stick. Um, and I can't help but wonder if one of the reasons why, you know, people who are trying to engineer microbiomes see resilience without being able to define specifically what it is that's enabling the overall function of the system. I mean, they have more complexity to work with. They have more interacting parts. Um, the reason, by the way, why I like your metaphor, and I'm going to call it a metaphor of cells doing computing, is because it enables us to extend this exceptionally productive metaphor of engineering in biology, even when it looks like it's going to break. Because it's done a lot of good work, but it doesn't go quite as far as we need it to. And talking about cells as computing facilities lets it go further. So one question we've got from the audience, which is particularly comes into your comments just then, Erica, it's quite an interesting question actually, is that um, in algorithms, uh, when people are doing evolutionary algorithms, um, there's a type called novelty search, mm -hmm. um, which specifically rewards um, solutions that are quite different from the other solutions that are being produced in the system. Is there any way that this can be incorporated into directed evolution and in engineering evolution? Has, has any of you uh, considered that? Um, do you have mechanisms, for example, Phil, for diversifying away from solutions that are maybe going to a single trajectory? Well, I mean, uh, this is sort of a trivial, there's a trivial approach where you target diversity to things that are highly conserved in phylogeny. Um, that would obviously take you away, hopefully, from the well-trodden path. Um, but um, a sort of a true novelty search is, is, is quite difficult simply because the search space kind of isn't, you know, certainly for proteins, it's, it's almost impossible to do a true novelty search. You have to start with proteins that are where you have, you know, some degree of folding to start with and some, you know, some, some kind of function. With RNA selections, we quite routinely start from, you know, the complete random pool. And there, you know, you sample a small fraction of a huge combinatorial space. And if you do the same experiment again and again, you, you keep sampling a different section of the sequence space because, again, it is so vast that you can't um, do any more. So I don't know if that answers the questions. It's not, it's not strictly a novelty search, but you just start your search from very different points. And Tammy, what do you think happens in, for example, a complex environment that naturally evolution is doing to reward alternative solutions? Um, so think a few things. So before I get to the complex things, I, I was just wondering if, um, if, if we could use some sort of RNA interference, right? It's something, uh, that's based on the amount of DNA in a pool, a competing pool that's identical, uh, and then, you know, target with pretty low efficiency um, against the exact sequence. Um, I don't know, if, I'm, I'm not um, super well versed in those topics, so I, I, but it seems like there might be something plausible that specifically would have a fitness cost for being the most abundant sequence um, in a population. Um, and, and we might be able to, to, to actually do this in a test tube. Now, in, in the environment, I actually think something that's doing that, exactly that, maybe phage, right? Um, and that phage uh, are going to target the most abundant sequences. Um, and so maybe actually, maybe actually that's the answer then in a test tube as well, is to have some phage. But I mean, you have to have some very inefficient phage, right, that are not going to kill the whole population. And, and have some way of making them not, uh, you know, evolve to be more efficient. But but I, I think that there there is some sort of possibility of sort of killing the winner, um, in order to to help you maintain more diversity in a population. And I also think in the in the, in the microbiome, spatial structure plays a, the diversity of, of uh, possible objective functions, 
works, right? So you have multiple objective functions that have some overlap, growth, um, and, and then you can access new new space. Right? We can think of the Lenski line. Some, Lenski lines, uh, only one of the 12 Lenski lines, right, uh, wound up eating citrate. And it, it's because there was an actually a different objective function buried in there uh, from the very beginning. Um, so one is objective functions and the two is uh, what Chang talked about and mentioned, I think, in his talk, uh, which is spatial structure, I think as well helps. So we have, um, we've hit the 5.30 in the UK. If people are willing to stay on for another 10 more minutes, maybe we'll go for a few more questions. But if anyone needs to leave, please leave. I, I don't want to take up your time. Sorry, Mark, we've got parenting duties to do. Um, another comment that has been raised in the Q&A, uh, we've seen how genomes of increased complexity require higher fidelity DNA um, repair. I think, Chang, you brought this up, right? Um, the other side of the debate, though, is we could improve DNA repair and maintenance to fight against evolution, basically to, to reduce the amount of mutation and divergence from the, the design state. Is that is that a worthwhile objective, or or is that you know trying to fight windmills? Chang, do you want to? Oh, Phil, you can you can go first. Well, I mean, I, th I, th I, th I think if you, if you try to, to go too far down that road, you're going to start paying, paying for it in viability because DNA damage is unavoidable. And you need to be able to repair it. And then you won't ever get, you know, 100% accurate repair. So unfortunately, um, you know, there, there is, you can't have a genome that's, cast in stone it's it's not going to happen it's chemically impossible but we do we have seen organisms designed to have reduced recombination so transposable elements for example being removed um yeah sure. that gets us some of the way all, all the selfish dna can go um i mean you can take out recombination in e coli but those bugs are pretty sick as you as you know so there is a price that can be so done. I have been reviewing, uh, you know, the different strategies that people have proposed over the years for stopping evolution or decreasing evolution. And there are like 10 different strategies and all of them are about reducing mutation rates, stopping recombination, uh, you know, like pulling together essential genes and non-essential genes and, and then making sure that they over preserve. I mean, people are very smart are, are, are proposing these things. Um, but I think that we miss some good metrics, you know, and, and, you know, I'm interested in my own laboratory to release things into the environment for bioremediation. And then this becomes a very, very serious issue and uh, how to make sure that you don't get mutations that can screw up the whole construct. And, um, you know, the best, best, best uh, containment uh, system that people have figured out for avoiding mutations is in the range of 10 to the minus 11. That is... A big, a big, it's an amazing number, but it still is completely insufficient to, you know, give security and give um, uh, give uh, assurance uh, to the potential users that this is going to behave always um, like that. You know, so I, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. But I think that the best approaches so far are concentrated in avoiding mutation rates, stopping recombination, and in the base case also to intermingle sequences for recombinant genes and essential genes. That's the approach. I, I actually, I want to mention one more idea about preventing evolution that's directly related to the, the work I presented today. So um, I think people are always thinking about how to engineer the organism, right, to slow the evolution. And, and that's really relevant if you want to do biome radiation and release things into a big lake or something. Um, right, but if, if you're trying to control evolution and the production of a costly byproduct, say, in a, in a fermenter, maybe we can use spatial structure to actually slow, not slow down mutation, but slow down the rate at which a mutation spreads in the population, right? Make randomness a big element of whether bacteria uh, produces uh, more progeny uh, than another. And, and you can do that by you know, making things in islands. You might be able to do such a thing in the environment if the bacteria somehow formed um, smaller droplets you know, or some, some sort of self-contained elements um, where, where they were separated in small, effect, smaller effective populations, 
unaffected, smaller absolute population sizes uh, as well. I, I think it's out there and I think it requires some more modeling and some more thought but, um, and testing, but I think it's, it's a real possibility. Yeah, I agree with that. Can I throw another idea out there, which is that, um, you know, uh, one thing I've thought about is um, if you make a cell sick in many ways, um, including through, you know, the artificial circuit you put in that you want it to maintain, <clears throat> then you can exploit this idea of randomness again, where if the cell is sick in many ways, and only one of those many ways is the way you care to retain, then you might have, uh, you can protect it, the, the, you know, the function you want, because the cell will likely achieve fitness through other ways before it destroys your, your thing, right? And so it's kind of in this idea of like how to increase the number of niches that can be um, the subject of selection um, that are not the niches that destroy your function, right? And spatial structure, I think, is one of these, uh, uh, is, is kind of a, a <clears throat> version of this idea as well. Um, yeah, but ultimately, I mean, indeed, right, there's this energy trade-off where if you want to do more error correction, you're always going to uh, have to pay a price and you can only get to you know you you have to reach some equilibrium <clears throat> and so i think if you can move things away from that equilibrium uh in either direction um, and the direction i'm proposing is that you actually make it easier to evolve in other dimensions that are not the one you care to keep um you can probably prolong the time it takes to reach that equilibrium again. Eventually you'll get there, but you know, eventually it could be like a hundred years and that'll be fine for us. Yeah. I think the time scales is something to keep in mind. I think we have one comment in the Q and A that says, you know, we're fascinated by what evolution has been able to achieve. You know, arguably it's the, the most powerful technology on earth but it, it has had um, a few billion years and the whole of earth as its melting pot so uh, engineering uh, at the dna levels only had about 50 years so far right now so um, perhaps the evolution's had a head start so we should probably end in a few minutes so i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the the last question to debate which will be one i guess erica was keen for us to debate in your pitch so erica you said why why is it safe to engineer evolution? Mm, or with yeah, evolution? I'm not actually keen on that question at all. It just comes up all the time. So I feel like I have to mention it. Um, I think it's actually kind of a silly question because it imagines some alternative in which we control everything. And I don't think that alternative is widespread um, if it exists at all. So I, I, would, I would respond to that question by pointing out that we're not talking about binaries between safe controlled things and unsafe uncontrolled things. And the second half of that answer, I suppose, is that um, we're assuming that humans are doing all of the work and all of the controlling and we've been talking about biocontrols and about ways to think about the environment uh, and you know often this idea that humans should be controlling everything or that we know how to fix problems gets us in a lot of trouble so I'd like to think about alternatives. I, I agree with you I mean I my personal feeling is that the very much of some of the things you said in your in your pitch that by having the analogy of engineering for um, living cells and trying uh, making people think of them as, as, as final machines does us a bit of a disservice for what biology can do. But at the same time, we need to then uh, be thinking about that when people think of control and safety around a machine like a car or, a, or, or something um, used in, uh, in a construction site, it's quite different to the sort of control and safety we should be thinking about. Yeah, biology. I love riding horses. I hate riding cars. Cars don't stop when they're about to hit something. Horses do. <laughs> That's a very good point. Victor, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, you know, um, I was thinking that, um, you know, our tragedy and our paradox is that we love evolution to get a solution to our problems. But once the solution is there, we just want to stop evolution altogether. 
So and how, how to deal uh, with that is going to be quite difficult. More complexity. <laughs> Phil, do you have any final thoughts on this? Um, on stopping evolution? I mean, I think if we could, if we could s somehow stop the bugs from growing, that would at least, uh, um, you know, if you could maintain them, let's say, in stasis for a very, very long time, that would at least, if ever mutations happen, they stay localized, then evolution would be sort of confined to that single cell where it happens. But um, again, I think... I guess, isn't that what happens a lot in a multicellular organism like myself? Well, no, that's exactly what happens in uh, multicellular organisms, of course, but, but, but also, um, oh well, I guess cancer is an example where, where the cells kind of don't play uh, yeah. after a while. And I'm, I assume the same would happen at, yeah. at, a, at a single cell level. If you had some sort of matrix where you had like all your yeast or bacterial cells organized in 3D, but they wouldn't grow. They would just produce what you wanted them to produce or compute, kind of like what you wanted them to compute. Um, but again, I think you would, you would have rogue cells appearing and then you would need to eliminate them. Tammy, do you have any final thoughts on this? You're, you're less of a synthetic biologist, so maybe you don't think it's safe and that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, um, it, the last question is on how, how to stop evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm, 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 as we mentioned, I think I, I the very, my first discussion on, answer on this panel, I'm, I'm very scared about it letting it, evolution run wild uh, in complex communities because uh, we, when we can't define the objective function. Um, of course, there are ways to uh, define the objective function, and I like the idea of adding a spe the specific type of complexity that the Chang mentioned of um, many other ways to, that it's bad, right? Many other ways, many other ways to get better, basically, right? Um, putting something far from the optimum, um, and so I, I really like that. Um, I, I like the the ecological approach. Um, I, I and and then I think you know I think the question is the time scale, right? Um, right, we could just add redundancies into the situation if we if we don't care if it eventually breaks. Um, you know, we just about yeah, we could change the time scale, right? But I think I think stopping evolution um, entirely is is a. I think everyone's been a bit negative here. I would like the idea that evolution could make the product or the or the or the therapeutic get better over time, right? I mean, there's a lot of talk of this. We'll have it work for a certain amount of time, and then hopefully it'll stop working. Um, it's a shame because in in, in evolution, it, it optimizes systems over time. Evolution creates cancer, though, right? I mean, it's 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 uh, it's it's evolution and ecology are extremely complex and chaotic and hard to predict, and so um, we need to have, I think, a lot of certainty to make sure that we don't cause cancer. Uh, uh, either an individual or an ecosystem. So, I, I think we need to be very cautious. I mean, an ecosystem is a nice positive version of it, of, of evolution working in your favor. Most of the time. It can Most occasionally time. backfire. It can also become cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not talk about that. No. I mean, Chang, do you do you have people specifically addressing your way of work and saying that they are worried that you know continuous in vivo evolution will generate um, things that are unsafe because you are not engineering it, so you are not planning it as a as someone maybe you know with the blueprints, the the sort of image of an engineer. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't had any salient. Uh, you know, threats or anything like this. Um, the uh, we do make that decision, though. I mean, one of the things that um, we've considered doing is using ortho rep to 
look at how uh, antifungal targets develop resistance, right? And so far we haven't done that because, you know, I think it's in the off chance that <clears throat> you make some amazing variant and it escapes, uh, it could have um, uh, negative consequences. So our drug resistance work has so far just been done on model targets where the drug is no longer the primary, uh, um, the, the primary mode of treatment. Um, yeah. But it, it's, a, it's a valid question. I mean, I think the one thing we should also keep in mind is that most of protein engineering through evolution is done in a way where you evolve the protein to discover a variant that does what you want, and then you just express it and use it in a non-replicating system, right? Once you remove self-replication, then you don't have evolution anymore. And so much of directed evolution has already solved this problem. But if we want to get into the case where we're using cells or other self-replicating entities, it'll always uh, pose a danger. Okay, well, um, does anyone have any burning comments or questions that we didn't get to address, panelists in particular, and, and those who gave the talk? If not, then I got to thank you guys for spending the time with me this afternoon and with many of our participants. Um, I did see in the, we were sent a comment from Francis Arnold, who was watching as well. Um, so that was nice. We had some real expertise in directed evolution. Uh, as some of our attendees. We had many other great uh, attendees as well and lots of questions and I'm sorry for all of those who asked questions that we weren't able to uh, answer all of them. But particularly thank you uh, Erica Victor for joining us on the panel and especially thank Phil, uh, Tammy and Chang for spending the afternoon or morning uh, with us and giving us great insight into your research. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, thank you. And yeah, thank send you, us Tom, feedback. Really. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for coming up with this idea to do yeah. this. <laughs> it's easier than paying for you all to fly here. <laughs> Organize these uh, discussions more often, Tom. Yeah, yeah, maybe, Good. maybe. Uh, okay, thank you, everyone. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.